viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Hello. Christina Abbotts was born on May the 25th, 1989 in the West Midlands. She later moved to London and was described as loving, caring, and a loyal family member and friend. She was described by her family as petite, happy, and well-educated. Her educational journey took her to the Royal Agricultural College in Cirencester, and then later to Oxford Brookes University. She presented herself as an IT consultant in the city. In truth, however, she maintained a secret identity as an escort. She operated under the alias Tilly Pexton, charging a staggering £2,000 per session. Her services were advertised online, and she met clients in upscale London hotels, as well as a rented flat in Crawley in West Sussex. Friend Howard Joseph, an airline pilot, described Christina as a sociable and personable woman, someone who embraced life to the fullest. She was often travelling, drinking and partying. Her job allowed her to socialise with a wealthy circle of friends, indulging in high-end experiences like fine dining and attending high-end events such as Royal Ascot and polo matches. Christina's parents remained unaware of their daughter's actual profession, but they did know about her association with an upper-class social set and about her frequent travels. At one point in her career, Christina Abbas crossed paths with Zahid Nassim. He was an employee of the Toronto Dominion Bank through an online platform. Nassim met Abbas on three occasions over a six-week period. This was usually in hotels and restaurants in London. Nassim would pay her approximately £3,500 each time. He described their relationship as commercial but very intimate. He also gave a approximately £2,000 to the friend for whom Abbott was house-sitting, and he actively looked for websites so he could rate her performance as an escort. In one conversation with a friend, he said, Luckily, I'm here to protect her from harm and the sick perverts out there. I don't want to break her. Hailing from Amersham, Buckinghamshire, Nassim began hiring escorts when his once thriving relationship with his partner eventually lost its spark and they drifted apart. Despite maintaining a successful career, Nassim was fired from his last job at Aberdeen Asset Management due to a substantial £20,000 entertaining expense. Nassim, a father of two, despite his £250,000 salary, somehow had a man significant debts. For nearly a decade, he frequently paid for escorts, he indulged in near-daily drinking, and he was a user of stimulants. Nassim attributed his high-stress job, which had taken him to New York whilst working for Merrill Lynch, as the source of his stress. It was on one of those stressful days when he decided to text Christina. On her birthday, May the 25th, Christina had arranged for a celebration with friends at the Park Plaza Hotel. This was situated at County Hall in London. However, on the eve of her birthday, she got a text from Nassim who asked to meet her. So, on the evening of May the 24th, Nassim met Christina in Crawley, West Sussex, and they went on to spend the night together. After taking a taxi from his Amersham residence, the two were captured in an Asda supermarket aisle. There, Nassim was seen kissing her on the forehead. In the shop, they bought her favourite brand of champagne, Verve Clicquot. Only a few hours later, he messaged his estranged partner, Helen Jarvis, with the words, It's too late. I'm sorry. Life isn't going to work out for me. Helen's immediate response was, What have you done? She attempted to call him but received no answer. The following day, Christina received birthday wishes from friends and family via text message. However, strangely, she did not respond to any of them. She also did not make an appearance at her own party, an event she was very much looking forward to. Growing concerned, her friend Roshan drove from London to her apartment at 11pm. When he couldn't get a response at the door, he called the police. Thank you. 
There's someone else here. Yeah, there's, there's someone else in here. Berkey, got another person in here. Another person in here. Is it for you, Nine. Nine, five, four, whiskey, zero, one. Okay, four, six, There's a knife on there, like Hang on, his eyes are flickering. What? No, 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 no. His eyes are flickering. Hello? 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 No, his eyes, no, no, his eyes are flickering. Ambulance, please. Ambulance, uh, on the what do you want me to do with that? Because obviously... It's fine. Leave it where it is. Mate, can you hurry up, please? Hello. Two officers promptly arrived and then forced their way into the top floor apartment at 2.30 a.m. Christina's friend, waiting downstairs, sensed the gravity of the situation from the expressions on the officers' faces. They found Christina's lifeless body inside the flat. In addition, Nassim was discovered in the living room, seemingly unconscious. He was wearing only a dressing gown. Surrounding him were partially consumed glasses of alcohol. This was along with illicit substance related paraphernalia. Hello, mate. The Gobi's here. I tried to get him to like wiggle his fingers or his toes or any part of his body, but obviously no response. Flickering. That's how we, we actually thought he was deceased initially, but on putting torchlight on his eyes, they were flickering. Come on, mate, you can hear me. Wakey, wakey! Come on, you can hear me, I know you can hear me. Because of the circumstances leading to you being here at the hospital, mm -hmm. okay, you are at this time under arrest on suspicion of murder, okay, you do not have to say anything, but it may harm his defence if you do not mention when questioned, something which you later on in court, anything you do say may be given evidence. At first, paramedics suspected Nassim of play acting, but he regained consciousness after being transported to the hospital. Later, during a police interview, he claimed to have no recollection of what had happened with Christina Abbas. Did you at any time think to call for help? I did. Tell, tell me about that. I did, and I was just, well, what the hell happens next? Sorry, Zai, when you say you did, no, I said I did think about it. Okay. And then I thought, well, what the hell's going to happen next? I can't see anything positive coming out of any of this. Did it, did it not cross your mind that they, you know, ambulance may have been able to assist her or...? I don't think she was alive. Right, okay. And um, without putting words, did you not panic and think, I need to phone the police? Something's obviously happened. I did, but I just I don't know. I just don't know. I just couldn't see what was going to happen that was going to change anything. Were you panicking at that time? I think I was just, just too much coming in, in, in mind at once. It was what, sorry? Just too many thoughts in my mind at once. Mm. OK. Did you actually phone anybody at all? I can't remember. Is that, uh, you can't remember, but you possibly may have done? I don't know. I can't remember. And, and if you did, then who would you have phoned? Who would you have liked to have, likely to have phoned? No one. I don't think I would have phoned anyone. Okay. I don't think I was in the state to phone anyone. Okay. So just to uh, take that in, there's 13 blows. I got this. To the head.
do you have to say about that? I think I'm just shocked. That's what I've got to say about. <laughs> Can you tell us how she came to suffer those injuries? No, I just don't know. That's why I'm shocked. There was, there was no fight. There was no. I don't. I don't know. I just don't know. My interpretation of this is that that would have been a repeated and prolonged attack. To have suffered thirteen separate blows to the head. Help us out with it. So how how is how has this come about? I have no idea. I have no idea. You know, I'm sure you spent quite a lot of time whilst you've been here in custody thinking about things and trying to think back. I'm trying to happened. I'm trying to piece it together that night and I can't piece it together. I just can't piece it. There is no frame of reference to piece it together. I mean, you've told Mike and I that nobody else entered the flat. The door was double locked with the key left inside. Mm. So that leaves you, Said. It's not me. I'm not that person. I don't. I don't remember hitting. I don't remember strangling. I don't remember any of that. So, if, if you had such a good relationship, then. Why didn't you even think about trying to get her help? Why didn't you even think about trying to call an ambulance for her? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Do I wish it was Thursday afternoon again? Yes, I wish it was Thursday afternoon again. Do I wish I'd never, I'd never come to, to her flat? Yes, I do. I can't turn the clock back. I can't change things. But do I wish any of this outcome? No. It's, it's, well, it's two lives ruined, and many others as well, probably. He said he was not some hyper high functioning psychopath trying to make up a story like it was something from Silence of the Lambs. I'm just telling you what happened or what didn't happen. I can't tell you more than that, he said. Nassim also said that he had never been violent, but he did admit to experiencing memory lapses. In messages on his phone, he made disturbing statements. He admitted a desire to make an escort feel degraded. His arrest came as a shock to both neighbours, friends and family. All of them struggled to believe the allegations made against the man that they thought they knew. Nassim, a marketing specialist, lived with his long-term partner in a £600,000 semi-detached house, situated in a private road not far from Amersham Town Centre. Neighbours expressed their disbelief and confusion, with one saying, I am really just too shocked to say anything about him. He is our neighbour, and a lovely man. Another neighbour questioned if they had the right person, saying, he is such a lovely man and always very friendly, and he says hello when you meet in the road. This just does not seem right. Another neighbour, wishing to remain anonymous, recounted the night of the incident, saying, The police and an ambulance arrived in the street at about 10.30pm last night, and we knew straight away that something bad had happened. Delivery driver Aaron Harvey, aged 24 and residing in a nearby block of flats, also recalled a concerning encounter with Christina Abbott's father. He mentioned speaking to the worried father the night of the incident. Harvey described how the distressed man had approached him. He said that he had been searching for his 28-year-old blonde daughter and that he was growing increasingly concerned. He said no one had heard from her for about 10 hours and he was worried. I felt sorry for him. He was panicking. I said I had seen a blonde girl who didn't live here quite a bit recently, but I didn't know her. I hadn't seen her that day.
During the trial, the judge said that he had presented himself as a well-spoken, educated and professional man seeking enjoyment, but the reality was much different. She pointed out the considerable stress arising from his unstable work situation, and they noted his growing obsession with escorts. This was coupled with a spiralling issue of stimulant and alcohol addiction, both of which were getting more and more out of control. During his court appearance, Nassim dressed in grey jogging bottoms and a top, spoke only to confirm his name, date of birth and address. Nassim had repeatedly denied the charge of murder. Instead, he claimed that he had acted in self-defence. He claimed that a red mist may have clouded his judgments during the incident. The prosecutor firmly dismissed Nassim's testimony, saying it was all a pack of lies. The banker was accused of subjecting his victim to a terrible attack an attack in which a post-mortem examination later revealed that Abbott's had endured 13 head injuries. This was along with compression injuries to her neck, consistent with being throttled. At some point around midday, Nassim struck Abbott's on the head with a kitchen pestle, leaving her on a bed in a horrifying scene surrounded by her own vital fluids. It was also discovered that Nassim remained in the flat for 12 hours following the murder. During this time, he engaged in alcohol consumption, substance use, and the transmission of explicit and adult material. This included pictures and videos of himself involved in intimate acts with other escorts. The flat yielded additional evidence including a bloodstained bottle of brandy, stimulants, poppers and the other half of the pestle and mortar. Nassim's DNA ridden fingerprints were also found on the bath, a sharp kitchen implement and on Christina's iPhone. However, Nassim claimed that Christina had attempted to throttle him during an adult game and that he responded by striking her in self-defence, losing control in the process. However, he was unable to provide an explanation to the jurors regarding the presence of the pestle, an object which was coupled with a mortar bowl discovered in the bedroom by the investigating officers. As a result, the jury did not accept his explanation. They totally rejected his claims of self-defence and loss of control. On January the 10th, 2019, after just 2 hours and 40 minutes of deliberation, the jury reached a unanimous verdict, finding Zahid Nassim guilty of murder. Prosecutors' assessment suggested that Nassim attacked Christina simply because he was angry and jealous. He was triggered when she appeared to divert her attention to the birthday messages on her phone, seemingly neglecting to give him the attention that he wanted. Attention that he perhaps demanded due to the exchange of money. This alleged altercation over her attention is believed to have escalated into a fatal incident. Additionally, the judge described Nassim's attack on Abbott's as being of extraordinary ferocity. She pointed out the considerable pain inflicted based on the extent of her injuries, noting the unimaginable terror she must have endured in her final moments. She also acknowledged the nature of Abbott's profession as an escort, saying that she had chosen to earn her money in a business with her long history but one that had always carried significant risks of danger. Christina Abbott's parents, along with her brother, wept in the public gallery while a victim impact statement was read to the court. In this statement, her father, a retired BT engineer, expressed the constant worry he and his family had regarding their daughter's safety, along with her financial situation while she lived in London. Christina had always assured them that she was doing okay, but the family missed her visits. Visits in which she had the power to brighten their lives with their happiness and positivity. He spoke of their shattered dreams, saying, I was hoping one day to walk her down the aisle. She would have been such a beautiful bride, and instead, we had to take her in a coffin. He added, May she rest in peace. We love you, Christina, and miss you so much. The parents also clarified that Christina had held legitimate jobs in estate agency and events, and they wanted to emphasise that she was much more than how she was portrayed in the case. They highlighted that Christina remained a loving, caring and loyal daughter, sister, niece and friend. In a post-sentence statement, they described the impact on their personal and professional lives. They said, 
This has had a tremendous impact on our personal and professional lives, as we have not been able to meet commitments due to the level of stress and shock we have been experiencing. We have our family tradition of going on holiday every year. We visited Tenerife and Lapland last year, Christina said in April. Mummy, why don't we go to southern France this year for our family getaway? But instead of planning the holiday, we had to go and plan her funeral. She was beautiful inside and out and also very kind to others, putting everyone else's needs first. Detective Chief Inspector Gemma Heater of Sussex Police also expressed her condolences for Christina Abbott. She acknowledged the strength and dignity displayed by Christina's friends and family throughout the case. Heater also mentioned that Zahid Nassim, after receiving medical treatment, cooperated with the investigation and openly discussed his knowledge of Christina and the true nature of their relationship. However, right until the end, he denied any intent to kill Christina. He attributed the incident to alcohol and substance consumption. He still to this day claims no recollection of how it all unfolded. Heater highlighted the far-reaching impact of Nassim's actions, affecting not only Christina's family but also his own. Now, everyone involved faces the challenges of rebuilding their lives. Zahid Nassim was sentenced to a minimum of just 19 years in prison. Nineteen-year-old Megan Holden was just restarting her life at such a young age. She grew up being known as a loving family girl whose life mission was spreading cheer. Everyone that knew her quoted her as being kind, down-to-earth and joyful. She went through life with little complaints, few enemies and a lot of love. Megan was also full of ambition. She was in her first year of higher education at Tyler Junior College. Although she was pursuing a solid future, she didn't want any kind of extravagance out of her life. Her life goal was to be close to her family, getting married and having a fulfilling life whilst making others happy. Megan lived in the big city of Tyler, Texas. It's known as the Rose Capital of America. It gained its name from the massive history of rose cultivation and processing, as well as being home to the largest rose garden in the United States. As well as that, the Texas Rose Festival is held in Tyler every year. Thousands of tourists are drawn to the parade, food and coronation of the Rose Queen. Although a large city, Tyler feels more like a vacation in nature than a bustling economy. This is a place that attracts many new residents. Megan had been working at the Snowflake Bakery in Delhi in 2004. This was a job that she thoroughly enjoyed. Part of the positivity she had at her job was the fact that she got to work alongside her serious boyfriend. That was until he tragically passed away from a severe asthma attack in October. Trying to cope with this loss at such a young age was difficult for Megan to process especially since she saw a tangible and very real future with him. While she did her best to move on from it, every time she walked into work, she saw him standing behind the counter in spirit. Her bosses said that she tried her best to move on, but the thought of working alone instead of with her partner was just too much to bear. In an attempt to start afresh and refocus her life, she moved in with her sister Carissa and began working at a Walmart in Tyler, Texas. Megan actually thrived in this position. Customers of the store said that she was one of the nicest people that they had ever met. Over the next few months, she would do her job well, while also juggling the demands of school. On January the 19th, 2005, Megan left her sister's house for another day of work. She was still working towards moving away from the life that she had envisioned, a life with her late boyfriend. But she was determined to keep moving forward in a positive direction. She had just bought herself a new truck and it was her pride and joy. This really was a showing of the fruitfulness of her hard work and dedication. There wasn't too much variety in her work as a clerk. 
but in a way she enjoyed the mundane. She spent her entire break talking to her mother, Sherry, about the tasks of the day, the frustrations and the victories. The phone call ended with Megan telling her mum that she would call her at 11.30pm on her way home from work. Her mother didn't think too much of it when her phone didn't ring until 1.30 in the morning. But the voice on the other end of the phone wasn't Megan. It was Chrissa, Megan's sister. She had called Megan dozens of times without an answer, and Chrissa was wondering if their mother had heard from her either. Panic must have set in in both of their hearts. It was completely out of the ordinary for Megan to not answer her phone. Upon calling the Walmart store, Megan's boss told Sherry that Megan had clocked out at her usual time, 11.30pm. As anxiety continued to grow, Sherry called hospitals and highway patrol offices to see if there were any car crashes in the recent hours, but nothing was reported. When 3am came with no word from Megan, Sherry called the police to file a missing persons report. Officer Roger West with the Tyler Police Department was swift to hop on the case. After questioning the family, Officer West learned that Megan worked at a Walmart in the area and that she had been at work until around three hours ago. He then visited the Walmart in hopes of obtaining a view of what had happened to her. Her boss, who was still at the store, definitively told Officer West that Megan had clocked out at precisely 11.41pm, but they said that no one had actually seen her leave. After retracing her route home from the Walmart and finding no sign of Megan, Officer West returned to the Walmart to retrieve surveillance footage. Walmart sent everything they had over to the Taylor Police Station, and there they reviewed it later that morning. And what the police saw was truly terrifying. Through surveillance video from outside the store, police watched the abduction of Megan by a mystery man unfold. They watched as an unidentified man, hidden by shadows and poor camera quality, pursue Megan after she walked out of the front door. As she reached her beloved pickup truck, the mysterious man ambushed her in a full sprint. He shoved her inside the car, following closely behind. The truck stayed there for only a couple of minutes, and then the headlights illuminated and the vehicle left the parking lot. At this point, exactly what had happened wasn't too important. What they knew now was that Megan was kidnapped, and if they wanted to find her alive, they had to figure out who had taken her. From the footage, the only things the officers could discern about the man was that he was pretty average. He seemed to be average height, weight, build, but they could see that he had a darker skin tone and appeared to be a man. The rest was left up to mystery. So, what could they do to narrow the search down? With no real luck in the parking lot, Officers tried to find other camera angles in an attempt to identify the man. They viewed camera footage from inside the store, but no luck was found in putting a name to the face that was covered by a baseball cap. The only hope they had was the camera from the front main entrance of Walmart, one that had a much closer view of patrons. While they stared at an empty frame, they would receive a strike of luck. The camera had caught the assailant entering the store. A freeze frame of the footage gave them a full colour image of the man. From there, they followed his every move. They even watched in shock as he stalked another woman to her car just 12 minutes earlier. However, this time he retreated when she pulled away in her vehicle before he could get to her. This gave them the clue that it was likely not someone that Megan knew. This was a man on the prowl. It seemed he would take anyone if the opportunity was there. Megan just happened to be in the wrong place at the worst possible time. While officers searched for possible leads regarding the man, others got to work tracing Megan's cell phone pings. They found that two hours after her abduction, her phone had pinged to a tower 10 miles away from the store. This was a solid lead to follow. However, frustratingly, the search of the area yielded no results. It would be another 24 hours until Megan's phone would ping again, this time to a cell phone tower in New Mexico, over 800 miles away. Officers scrambled to communicate to various police stations out west, 
They lived in the hope that one of them would be able to find Megan or her vehicle with the help of Tyler Police's descriptions. Hours later, a phone call to 911 in Arizona detailed an armed robbery that had just taken place at the store. The caller explained how the unidentified man had pulled a firearm on him and demanded money. But what the man didn't know is that the shop owner was also armed. The owner fired a shot at the man in retaliation and it struck him. The injured assailant ran back to his car. The caller identified him as leaving in a red pickup truck with Texas plates, a truck that looked and sounded awfully similar to Megan's. With this call in progress, the police department in the area dispatched an officer to a nearby hospital. They hoped that the unnamed assailant would visit for the treatment of his wounds. Staking out the parking lot, the officer saw the familiar truck drive right by. They quickly ran the license plate number. Based on these results, immediate contact was made with the Tyler Police Department. The officer, Officer Crandall, described a man with dark skin, somewhere between 5 foot 10 and 6 feet, of average weight and average build. This must have been their guy, the one who had taken Megan. The only problem was, Megan wasn't inside the truck, and as far as they knew, she had never entered the hospital either. The officer made his way inside the building and spoke to the receptionist. He prepared himself to try and arrest an obviously violent man. As he entered the waiting room, Crandall saw a man lying in a hospital bed with a severe wound to his shoulder. A nurse nearby was administering medication through an IV line. The man thought that Crandall was there to investigate the circumstances of his bullet wound. And as he turned his head to talk to the nurse... Crandall swiftly handcuffed the man to the bed. This is when Officer Crandall finally put a name to the face of Megan's abductor. He was Johnny Lee Williams. Research into his background showed that he lived in Smith County, a location about 10 miles away from where Megan worked. Tyler police quickly put together that this is where Megan's phone had originally pinged, and officers were immediately dispatched to his home. But upon arrival, Johnny's rural trailer was empty, and Megan was nowhere to be found. What they did find was a Walmart gift card, one that was registered to Megan Holden. What they didn't find, however, was any indication that Megan was fatally harmed, this left them optimistic towards the prospect of still finding her alive. But that hope would soon fade away on Saturday morning, January the 21st. As a construction worker was getting ready for a hard day's work along a Texas highway, he made a terrifying discovery. It was the body of a woman, one that had received numerous bullet wounds to her body and was now laying in a ditch. An autopsy quickly identified the body as indeed being Megan Holden, the cause of her passing being the firearm injuries. Tyler police had everything they needed to charge Johnny Williams. Upon Johnny's intake in Texas, he immediately suggested a full confession. This would be in exchange for avoiding the death penalty. Police spoke with Megan's family to discern whether this was the right decision, ultimately deciding that knowing what had happened and why was more important than that penalty. No matter what, Johnny would never see the outside world of a prison cell again. The police agreed to his bargain, and they listened intently. He detailed the story of what had happened that night. Johnny said he was dropped off at a gas station near the Walmart. He said his intentions were set before he even arrived. He was going to kidnap someone and get as far away from Tyler as possible. Once he arrived at Megan's car, he demanded her keys from her, and then she freely handed them over out of immense fear. He smoked some illicit substances as he drove Megan back to his trailer. There, he violated her and smoked some more. After about three hours, he took Megan to the car again, and then they made their way out to Smith County. They checked into a hotel in Odessa, and Johnny violated Megan for a second time. This was in a hotel room on Friday morning. By 7pm on Friday evening, 
Johnny had a change of heart and decided to bring Megan back to Tyler. But according to his story, during the drive, Megan hit Johnny in the face. This was her attempt to get away as the vehicle slowed. He said this sent him into a blind rage. He claims he grabbed Megan by the neck. He then threw her out of the car and throttled her until she passed out. He said he then picked up his firearm and shot two or three rounds. He said he couldn't remember exactly how many, but they hit her in the head. Immediately after this, he drove to get a cheeseburger, quoted as saying that his stomach was empty. Johnny's attack on Megan was completely baseless. The family had to swallow the fact that Johnny had taken Megan simply because he wanted to and he had the means to do it. Johnny Lee Williams was sentenced to multiple consecutive life sentences for his crimes in 2005, the possibility of him ever leaving being zero. Johnny's parents were appalled to hear of his crimes. They said that after serving four years in the military, he came home haunted and full of rage. They spoke of how he never got the help that he needed, and that his mental instability caused the rageful crime spree that unfolded in late January. Johnny's mother said, Some of the things that he had to endure I may never know, but it changed him, and for that I am sorry. A candlelit visual was held for Megan Holden outside the Walmart where she worked. Over 100 people attended. Every person that was present at the visual talked solely about the positive impact that Megan had on their life. Just one more good soul ruthlessly stolen from the world. I feel like she's with someone against her will. Or maybe worse. Savannah Page Gold was a 21-year-old woman from Jacksonville, Florida. She had a heart of gold to match her name. She was a remarkable young woman who was known for her charm. She was kind and had a compassionate nature. She was born to Daniel and Sherry, joining brother Chris. Savannah had a special bond with her mother. They were not just mother and daughter, but also best friends. Sherry was sadly battling with cancer, so the doting daughter helped her to navigate the challenges of chemotherapy. This helped them to form a unique relationship built on love and support. Savannah truly was priceless to the family. She also worked hard at Bonefish Grill as a waitress. This was a job she had been in for around two years, and there she left a lasting impression on her co-workers and the customers that she served. All of this whilst making money to support the family. Her genuine and friendly personality made her a beloved figure in the restaurant. Her friends described her as someone who loved fiercely, gave generously, and someone that had a fantastic sense of humour. She was a perfectionist in her endeavours, and she always strived to give her best. It was evident that she approached life with passion and dedication. Savannah had dreams of attending the coincidentally named Savannah College of Art and Design. She even received scholarships for her talents in lacrosse and art. However, her decision not to pursue this path showed her deep-rooted commitment to her family, with her mother's health concerns leading Savannah to put her family's well-being above her own ambitions. Her presence in the lives of those around her made her a cherished daughter, sister and friend. Jacksonville is a vibrant city in the northeastern area of Florida. It sits along the Atlantic coastline of the United States. As the largest city by land area in the US, it has a huge mix of both natural landscapes and urban attractions. On August 2nd, 2017, Savannah had begun her day like any other. She prepared to go to her shift at the Bonefish Grill. This was set to begin at 5.30pm. On her way to work, she spoke with one of her good friends. During the conversation, they happily talked about the next time that they would get together. Savannah had begged her friend to hang out with her over the previous days but her friend had been sick with a cold. A cold that she jokingly said that Savannah had given to her. They continued to make future plans of spending time together, and then Savannah ended the conversation to begin her shift at the restaurant. 
Ten minutes later, Savannah's supervisor was expecting her to show up at any moment, ready to start work. It was a rather slow day inside the restaurant on a weekday, and she was scheduled to work after all. When Savannah never walked through the door, her supervisor grew slightly frustrated. However, they simply removed her hours from the schedule, and business continued as usual into the evening. 30 minutes after Savannah's failure to appear at work, her father received a text message coming from her phone number. The message detailed how Savannah had found a man that she had fallen in love with, and that this love was so intense that they were going to run away together. They were willing to leave both of their families and their homes behind. The message also said that Savannah would contact her parents, but only once she and her newfound love arrived at their final destination. Destination. Moments later, Savannah's brother also received a text message from his sister, one that said that she couldn't take it anymore, saying that she had to leave town. Once the initial surprise of this news wore off, Savannah's parents took a second to read over the message more carefully. After noticing multiple grammatical and spelling errors throughout the messages, Savannah's mother quickly took note of the words that were used and the structure of the message. Since they texted quite frequently throughout each day, Savannah's mother almost immediately knew that something was wrong. Whoever was sending these messages was not her daughter. Savannah's parents swiftly called her number. They were hoping that they would hear her familiar voice on the other side of the line. However, when the call was sent straight to voicemail, the anxiety they were feeling only grew. After multiple attempts to reach her, they began to think of other ways that they could make sure that Savannah was safe. Knowing that she had a shift at the Bonefish Grill, they called the number of the restaurant in order to check on her. When a supervisor who answered the phone reported that Savannah had never turned up for work, the concern in their stomachs turned into a deep-rooted fear that something was gravely wrong. They wasted no time in contacting the police. The hunt for Savannah Gold was on. Since Savannah's last known location was somewhere between her home and the restaurant where she worked, the first place investigators visited was the Bonefish Grill. They walked inside and asked employees about Savannah, asking whether they had seen her, whether they knew where she was, or if they had any information to help their investigation. Meanwhile, other officers were in the parking lot. They were scouring for any sign that she might have been there at some point. To their surprise, they quickly found Savannah's car in the back of the parking lot. The doors were unlocked and upon further inspection, all of her important belongings were inside. This included her ID and her purse. The driver's side tyre had been punctured. It sat flatly on the parking spot. This discovery led police to seriously question the validity of the messages that had been sent from Savannah's phone. They now firmly believed that Savannah had been kidnapped. With this information, officers obtained security camera footage from the restaurant. This footage provided a view of the parking lot, including Savannah's parking spot. The camera showed Savannah arriving to work in her car at 5.30pm. This was exactly when her shift was scheduled to begin. Savannah then got out of her car wearing her uniform. She then walked over to a silver sedan which was parked directly beside her. After talking with the occupant of the vehicle for 15 minutes through the driver's side window, Savannah walked around to the other side of the car and got into the passenger seat. As officers continued to watch the footage, they became increasingly concerned as the video showed the silver sedan beginning to shake. It showed the door opening and then forcefully being slammed back shut. Were they now witnessing Savannah's abduction? And then suddenly the vehicle was still. Investigators squinted their eyes as a driver emerged from the vehicle. They then walked over to Savannah's car and opened the driver's side door. 
The quality of the security video revealed no defining features. It only showed a man who was roughly six feet tall and had short brown hair. They continued to watch as a man reached his arm inside the car. He then took out Savannah's phone and then returned to his silver sedan. A moment later, the man walked back to Savannah's car a second time. There, he knelt down and punctured the driver's side tyre. At 6.04pm, the mysterious man in a silver sedan is shown leaving the parking lot, and as far as they could tell, Savannah was seemingly still inside the car. This footage was immediate confirmation that Savannah had been abducted, and now time was of the essence to locate her. According to this footage, Savannah hadn't been missing for long, so their hopes of finding her alive were still high. Investigators immediately got to work. They spent the following two days gaining every piece of evidence that they could. Evidence obtained from Savannah's family, friends and her co-workers. By August the 4th, the Jacksonville police already had three potential suspects in Savannah Gold's disappearance. The next thing to do was cross-reference the suspects that they had gathered with the description of the silver sedan from the security footage. From running the names and dates of birth through the Department of Motor Vehicles database, they discovered that their first suspect didn't even have a license. There was no record of a vehicle being registered to him. Their second suspect was found to drive a red jeep. He too was quickly passed over as the culprit in Savannah's kidnapping. Finally, upon a search with the information of their third suspect, they found that he owned a silver Chevy Malibu. This was an exact match to the vehicle seen in the parking lot of the Bonefish Grill. Lee Rodart Jr. had been the manager and chef at the Bonefish Grill for five years. When police had questioned him after Savannah's disappearance, he had explained to officers that they had been working together for a long while, but he said that they were not friends outside of that work arrangement. They were strictly co-workers, and Lee claimed he hadn't seen Savannah since her last shift at the restaurant. However, upon questioning other employees at the grill, officers quickly found out that Lee and Savannah had been having an on and off, romantically charged relationship for the past eight months. There were three reasons why Lee wouldn't have told officers about his relationship with Savannah. Number one, it was against company policy to have romantic relationships with co-workers. And number two, Lee had a girlfriend at the time. Therefore, he was hiding crucial information to the investigation. And despite these logical reasons for withholding this information, police still listed Lee as a potential suspect. This proved to be useful as his vehicle matched the one that drove away just two days before with Savannah inside. In addition to this, police also noticed that when they first questioned Lee, he had a few cuts and scrapes on his neck and arms. This was only technically circumstantial, but it still raised alarm bells in the investigators' minds. On August the 5th, 2017, Lee Rodart was arrested by officers on a warrant for driving with a suspended license. This was the opportunity investigators needed to question Lee a second time about his associations with Savannah. Police began by asking Lee to explain a second time his relationship with her. It was at this point that Lee confessed to his first lie that he told to the police. He now admitted to officers that he and Savannah had formed a romantic connection, a connection that started soon after they began working together. He said they began spending time together outside of work, but they kept this relatively secret as Lee had a girlfriend at the time. Lee continued to explain that it wasn't long before Savannah began displaying problematic behaviour, behaviour that Lee didn't agree with. According to him, since he was in a relationship and they were moving so fast, he made the decision to start distancing himself from Savannah. He said he told her that they couldn't talk to each other anymore. 
As the questioning officer continued to question Lee, he asked a second time when the last time that he'd seen Savannah was. Lee then confessed to the second lie that he had told. He now admitted that he had talked to Savannah three days earlier on the day that she disappeared. According to him, he and Savannah had both arrived to work at the grill at the same time that day and that they had even parked next to each other. When Lee had seen Savannah, he asked to talk to her for just a second. Lee detailed how the two discussed the fact that Savannah had been telling her co-workers about their previous fling. And remember, this fling was something that was against company policy and Lee didn't want to get fired. It was at this point that Savannah got into the car and an argument began. According to Lee's story, Savannah was angered by this confrontation. She apparently said that she was allowed to talk about whatever she wanted with her co-workers. After a period of raised voices and swearing, Lee told officers that Savannah got out of his car and walked out of the parking lot. He said there she was picked up by a green old Ford truck. Whilst Lee had chosen to be more truthful than he was the first time round, officers knew that he was still lying. After much preparation for this very moment, officers prepared to reveal the evidence they already had. With an eerie calmness, the questioning officer revealed to Lee that they knew his story was a complete fabrication. He was lying. They explained that they had seen the security footage of Lee leaving the parking lot in his car, a car that Savannah got into but never got out of. Lee continued for a long while to deny that he took Savannah anywhere, resting on his story that she had been picked up by a green truck. However, officers would not and could not accept this story, so they continued to press Lee for the truth. They made it abundantly clear that they knew what had really happened. And eventually, after a long and gruelling interrogation, Lee Rodart finally gave in to the pressure that he faced from those questioning him. You can do this. You can do the right thing. She was hitting me. I just... She wouldn't stop. And I'd squeeze back. Okay. And she was just... She under your arm or something, or she started hitting me. You know, after her, I, you know, slashed her tire, right. and we went back and forth, and I just I squeezed her. You squeezed her around her neck or around her neck with your hands. She had. It. She had. she had her hands around mine. Okay. And you had yours around hers and y'all were just fighting back with each other. Okay. She just wanted to let go and I didn't let go. Everything that Lee had said prior to Savannah exiting the vehicle had been true. They had gotten into an argument about Savannah telling people about their romantic ventures. However, instead of getting out of the car, Lee explained that Savannah started to physically attack him. He continued to say that he had to defend himself against Savannah's strikes. This was until he eventually had to wrap his hands around her neck. He said he squeezed until he heard a popping noise. He says he looked down and realised that he had accidentally ended Savannah's life. And that all of this was just an attempt to protect himself. Lee continued to explain that after this occurred, he left a parking lot with Savannah in the car and drove back to his house. It was here where he placed Savannah's body in his fire pit and then set it alight. He said he burned over 75% of her body before removing it. He then wrapped it in sheets and put it back in his vehicle. He then drove to a lake in the woods of a dead-end street, and there he dumped her body into the water. 
Lee remained firm on the notion that he had accidentally ended the life of Savannah Gold, that this was indeed just a case of self-defence. Officers confirmed Lee's story with further security footage, video which showed evidence of his car at the lake on the day of Savannah's disappearance. Officers travelled to the lake and made every attempt possible to gather more evidence, and hopefully to recover Savannah's body. With the assistance of a dive team, Savannah's body was recovered from the water. An autopsy was promptly performed. However, this autopsy would prove essentially nothing. The burns to her body had concealed her cause of death. The only thing they did know was that Savannah had suffered a violent homicide at the hands of Lee Rodart. When Lee was charged with second degree homicide, he pled not guilty due to the fact that he was acting in self-defence. He was subsequently remanded without bail until his trial. It took two years for Lee's case to go to trial in August of 2019. It took this long because multiple delays and postponements had taken place. When his court date finally arrived, Lee filed the Stand Your Ground petition, a law in Florida that protects those against prosecution if they were in fear for their life when they committed homicide or other severe bodily injuries. While this law in Florida more closely pertains to people who are the victims of home invasions, Lee's legal team still attempted to make it stick in this case. While the judge denied the petition and faced appeals, the trial continued to be put on hold. This meant that Savannah's family went for years without any relief from the pain that they were suffering. By February 2021, Lee and his legal team had finally realised that their appeals were getting them nowhere. Therefore, Lee changed his plea from not guilty by reason of self-defence to guilty of second-degree homicide. As part of Lee's plea deal, he would avoid the life sentence that he could have received if his case went to trial, and he would then instead receive 40 years in prison. From the years of delays in his case, the judge awarded Lee credit for the time he had served so far. This left 37 years to serve in prison, meaning that Lee could be released in 2058. Following the sentencing, Savannah's family spoke about the evil that Lee Rodart had committed against their daughter and sister. With Lee's back turned, he wiped away tears as Savannah's family remembered the positive light that she was in their lives, stating how Lee had taken it away so mercilessly. Savannah's father spoke about the immense, endless love that he had for his daughter, stating that the only way they could continue to go on without her is through knowing that she wouldn't want her passing to ruin their lives. And as for Savannah's mother, she struggled as her cancer had returned and twice over the course of Lee's arrest, spanning over his conviction and the rest of the legal proceedings. Because of this pain and suffering on an extreme level, the judge ordered Savannah's mother to be awarded $9,000 in restitution, and then an additional $12,000 to be awarded to a victim trust fund. Following the hearing, Savannah's brother reflected on his experience throughout the past three years. He stated that he was grateful to the professionals who so swiftly investigated and then gained justice for his sister. In addition to the restitution and the victim trust fund, the public raised an additional $6,000 in order to help the Gold family pay for Savannah's funeral expenses. This was done through a GoFundMe campaign. The Gold family will always remember Savannah as a kind-spirited, giving and artistic soul, someone who radiated kindness to everyone around her. I've had my eyes on him for four weeks and he has not looked at me once because he's a coward and that's exactly what he is. Ellie Marlene Edwards was born on May 10, 1996 in New Brighton. New Brighton is a peaceful community known for its vibrant beachfront and welcoming atmosphere. She was a popular beautician and a dental nurse. Ellie was described by her father as radiant. She had the kind of smile that could brighten any room and any day. She also had a habit of offering warm embraces and checking up on people. 
Her hugs had the power to uplift even the gloomiest of days. Her infectious laughter guaranteed that anyone in her company would have a good time, and she embraced life with enthusiasm and positivity. She had a lot of dreams that she pursued, and she was on the cusp of making them all come true, basking in the happiest phase of her life. With a magnetic personality, she had an ability to make people fall in love with her upon first meeting. On December 24, 2022, 26-year-old Ellie Edwards was celebrating Christmas Eve with her sister and friends at the Lighthouse Inn in Wallasey Village, Merseyside. During Christmas, Wallasey Village comes alive with the spirit of the season. The town's strong sense of tradition and community makes it a particularly special place at this time of year. Locals and visitors alike join in the spirit of the season, dancing, singing, and sharing in the joy of the holiday. On that evening, Lucy Edwards, her sister and her friends were in high spirits, singing along to the Christmas classics inside the pub. Just before midnight, Ellie went outside for a cigarette. While the rest of her group were at the bar getting drinks, they suddenly heard loud bangs. Initially, everyone thought they were fireworks. Not the most unusual thing to hear on Christmas Eve. However, in mere moments, Ellie collapsed on the floor. Jess, a friend of Ellie, recalled that everything happened in a blur. She and the rest of Ellie's friends wished they could have done more but they soon realised there was nothing else to be done. A woman tried to perform CPR on Ellie as she lay breathless, but it was in vain. Heartbreaking footage captured her final moments, showing her warmly greeting friends with hugs and a radiant smile. Despite efforts to save her, she was pronounced dead on Christmas Day at Arrow Park Hospital. The stark contrast from one moment to the next is almost unimaginable. Ellie Edwards was formally identified by her father, Tim Edwards. The post-mortem examination revealed the extent of Ellie Edwards' injuries, injuries which were very clearly non-survivable. She had been struck twice in the back of her head. One projectile passed through her skull and brain, exiting just above her right eye, while the second projectile pierced her skull and entered her brain. All necessary pathological examinations had been completed. This allowed Ellie's body to be released to her family so they could make arrangements for her funeral. The funeral was held on January the 25th, 2023 at St Nicholas Church in Wallasey. Hundreds of people laid flowers and watched the funeral procession pass through the streets. The service was attended by those close to Ellie. And all of this because, on Christmas Eve, a day that was supposed to be filled with joy and happiness, an innocent life was taken in front of hundreds of happy people. It was later discovered that Ellie Edwards was simply at the wrong place at the wrong time. A mixed DNA profile was found on a bullet casing recovered at the scene. Additionally, this same DNA was detected on a glove recovered at someone's house. And this glove matched the red gloves worn by the gunman as captured on CCTV from the Lighthouse pub. The DNA belonged to none other than 23-year-old Connor Chapman. He was later tracked down and arrested whilst at Tesco's in Newtown. This is that footage. In fact, the day that he shot Ellie marks the first Christmas in five years that Connor Chapman had not been behind bars. Chapman was raised in Birkenhead's rugged Woodchurch estate. He was a persistent troublemaker from his early teenage years. By the time he was 14, he had already appeared in courts for shoplifting, and at just 15, his criminal record included convictions for offences such as burglary, assault and possession of an offensive firearm. His social media presence from that period was littered with scarcely legible complaints. Complaints about having to wear an ankle monitor, also known as a tag. On his 15th birthday, Chapman posted, Proper devoed, short for devastated, am on tag, would have rather add messy one, will or with the lads. Two months later, he wrote, Four days left on this tag. A friend of his cautioned him, you just behave yourself when it's gone, young man. But of course, Connor Chapman did anything but. On that fateful day, Chapman had lurked outside the pub in Wallasey Village, 
He laid in wait for nearly three hours before using a military-grade weapon, a weapon capable of firing 15 rounds per second. During the trial, a video was presented that depicted the horrifying events. In the video, it was evident that five men and Ellie were injured. Injured when Connor Chapman opened fire with this Scorpion submachine gun. After the attack, Chapman fled the scene in a stolen black Mercedes A-Class. He eventually reached the residence of Thomas Waring in Barnston. Waring was born on September 30th, 2002, and at the time of the offence, he was just 20 years old. Waring then arranged for a taxi to transport Chapman, and this taxi allegedly took him back to his home in Woodchurch. The shooting was a culmination of a series of retaliatory actions between rival groups, different gangs from the Woodchurch and Ford Estates situated on opposite sides of the M53 in Wirral. These confrontations included assaults, burglaries and previous shootings. The jury learned that Chapman, who lived on Houghton Road in Woodchurch, wanted to take the lives of two of the men injured in the shooting. The men were Kieran Solkeld and Jake Duffy, both from the Beechwood area. Solkeld and Duffy were from a rival gang who had assaulted Chapman's associate, a man named Sam Searson, just the day before. This is the video from that assault, but I can't really show you it. Both Duffy and Solkeld suffered serious injuries in the shooting. The three other men injured in the attack were not connected to the feud at all, just like Ellie. Nigel Power, KC, the prosecutor, revealed that Connor Chapman had recorded a rap video whilst in custody the previous year. He was inside following an aggravated burglary at his mother's residence. In the video, he said, If I make it out of here, I'm due to become famous because if you touch one of mine... I'll leave your soul on the pavement. He also said, I know I've been a scumbag, but I'm proud of that. During the trial, Connor Chapman firmly denied being a shooter, but a combination of CCTV footage and evidence from mobile phone cell towers was presented to confirm his role in the attack. He faced a series of convictions related to the tragic events surrounding Ellie Edwards. He was found guilty of Ellie's murder. This was as well as the attempted murder of Kieran Solkeld and Jake Duffy, and wounding with the intent to cause grievous bodily harm against the other men injured in the attack. He was also convicted of assaulting another man which resulted in actual bodily harm. He also faced charges of possession of a firearm and possession of ammunition with the intent to endanger life. This was specifically concerning the Scorpion submachine gun. He had also pleaded guilty to one count of handling stolen goods. This was in relation to the stolen Mercedes used during the incident. During the sentencing, the judge addressed Connor Chapman and Thomas Waring. He said, You, Chapman, were very actively involved in the Woodchurch gang, while you, Waring, were associated with it. The violence within this feud included shootings and generated significant concerns for the people of Merseyside. On December 23rd last year, one of your associates was attacked by Kieran Solkeld and Jake Duffy, and you decided to seek revenge. The judge then described how Chapman prepared for the act of violence. He wore dark clothes, a mask and gloves and avoided the security cameras in the neighbourhood. He then said, You waited for almost three hours in the car park, close to the front door where you hid inside your stolen car, waiting for your moment. Just before midnight, you burst forward to fire the submachine gun. Ellie Edwards lost her life instantly and you injured five others. Any of them could have easily lost their lives as well. Connor Chapman received a life sentence with a minimum of 22 years each for the attempted murders of Kieran Solkeld and Jake Duffy. These sentences will run concurrently with the 48-year minimum term for the murder of Ellie Edwards. This results in a total minimum sentence of 48 years. Chapman has two children, one of whom he has never met. These children will be middle-aged by the time he is potentially released. As Chapman was led away from the courtroom, Tim Edwards, Ellie's father, maintained a steadfast gaze on him in the dock. The judge concluded proceedings and Chapman was then escorted to the cells. An emotional outburst was heard from Ellie's family members in the public gallery. 
They expressed anger and disgust directed towards Chapman as they said, see you later, and scumbag. Although being a scumbag seems to be something he was proud of. His co-defendant Thomas Waring was sentenced to nine years in prison for possessing a prohibited weapon and for assisting an offender. His assistance included helping to burn out the stolen Mercedes, the car used in the commission of the murder. Regarding the charges of possession of a prohibited weapon, a crime which carries a maximum sentence of 10 years, the judge referred to the five-year minimum term that applies due to the nature of this offence. He argued that there was no reason to disapply this minimum term. This was given the high culpability because of the way Waring possessed the firearm. He essentially helped Connor Chapman avoid detection. The judge also addressed the charge of assisting an offender. This has a starting range of six to eight years with a maximum of ten years. This charge was related to the involvement in burning the car used in the attack. The judge noted that Waring had failed to comply with a disclosure notice, a charge to which he had admitted. He emphasised the seriousness of this offence, as it was an attempt to obstruct the investigation into Ellie Edwards' murder. Ellie lost her life due to Waring and Chapman's vengeful actions, and her family will never fully come to terms with this devastating tragedy. Her grandmother, Susan Edwards, expressed in her impact statement that Ellie was very, very special to her and she had been her best friend. She lamented, If I were to die tomorrow, the coroner would write on my certificate, cause of death. She died of a broken heart. She emphasised how much she misses her angel princess. Connor Edwards, Ellie's older brother, also spoke about his sister during the proceedings. He understandably found it incredibly difficult to talk about her. Ellie was planning to cook Christmas dinner for the first time with their mother. When they spoke on the night that her life was taken, Ellie said that she was with a friend, and Connor wished her a good night. He shared that they had many happy memories growing up, even though they had typical sibling arguments. Ellie had a way of making people feel good about themselves. Connor mentioned that he has a young son who always asks about Ellie. When he sees pictures of her, he points to the sky. He describes how their family is struggling with Ellie's absence. Their mother especially is heartbroken. Ellie and her mother had a very special relationship and Ellie was always there to help. She was a fun, caring person who brought happiness to everyone she met. On the night of the shooting, Connor woke up to terrible news. He went to their parents' house and had to tell his dad that Ellie had been struck in the head. When they reached the hospital, they learned that Ellie had already passed away. In that moment, their lives were shattered. Despite the tragedy, Connor had to put on a happy face for his son on Christmas Day. He says that Ellie didn't deserve what happened to her. Every day he goes to bed and wakes up feeling the pain of losing his sister. Christmas was always a special time for their family. They always spent it together. Losing Ellie during the holidays was incredibly difficult. However, the family remained strong and united. Brother Connor concluded by saying he loves and misses Ellie and he will cherish the 26 years that they had together. Please, I've just, I've just come back to my flat and the door was locked, so I crawled through the window and my flatmate's covered in blood in the bathroom. Oh my God, she's dead, she's dead. Alice Ruggles, who was born on Christmas Eve in 1991, was the second youngest of four children born to Clive Ruggles and Sue Hills. She enjoyed a close-knit relationship with her siblings as they grew up in Leicestershire, England, in the quiet village of Ter Langton. By all accounts, Alice had a pretty idyllic childhood. It was filled with unconditional love from parents and a loving, fun-filled relationship with her siblings. With her quick wit, empathetic nature, as well as her outgoing personality, Alice made friends quickly. Her beautiful smile and joyful personality drew people in towards her. She was comfortable with being in the limelight since she was a natural entertainer. Alice was a young woman who enjoyed performing in school concerts. She had many interests and hobbies, and one of her favourites was fencing. This is a hobby she began doing at 11 years old. Her love of fencing led to spending time on the national fencing circuit. 
and this even influenced which university she selected at age 18. She attended uni in Northumbria, becoming captain of the fencing club. After graduation, Alice had no trouble finding a job that she loved, and her future really was looking bright. She moved into a flat on Rawling Road in Gateshead. It was a cosy home that she shared with a co-worker. Gateshead is an area known for its cultural diversity. It was an ideal place for a young vibrant woman like Alice to be. With her natural beauty, sense of humour and friendliness, Alice was bound to attract a fair share of suitors. In October of 2015, Alice entered into a relationship with a man named Treman or Harry Dillon. Dillon was a soldier based at Penacook, south of Edinburgh. This was about 120 miles away from where Alice lived. The two enjoyed their first weeks together in an online relationship. This was because, at that point, Dylan was in Afghanistan for the military. In January of 2016, Alice and Dylan met in person for the first time after their whirlwind online romance began. Dylan was able to make the trip because it was on a short period of leave, and he then returned to the UK permanently in April of 2016. Shortly thereafter, Alice's friends began to notice changes in her behaviour. Alice lost weight and was no longer happy and outgoing. She became withdrawn and kept to herself. This was a stark contrast to her normal habits of socialising with others. Her family became concerned about how unhappy she appeared, and even her work performance was beginning to suffer. Alice's world had changed because of Dylan's criticism of every aspect of her life. This included her appearance and her friends and family. He demanded that she focus all of her attention on him. Alice's friends and family became concerned with how Dylan contacted her so frequently, and they could now see that he seemed to be in control of her every move. The relationship between the couple had a lot of ups and downs. Some days everything seemed great between the two of them, while other days were filled with problems and arguments. As their relationship continued, Dylan often demanded to know what Alice was wearing. He wanted to know where she was going, and which people she would be seeing and when. If she didn't respond to his messages quickly enough for his liking, he would start contacting her friends and family, urging them to ask her to respond to him. Occasionally, Dylan would drive almost two hours from his barracks just to show up unannounced at whatever place he knew Alice would be at. During this time when Alice had become even more withdrawn, and as her friends were more and more worried about her, a woman reached out to Alice to tell her that Dylan was on a dating website, and that he was pursuing other women romantically. As proof, this woman sent Alice screenshots of the messages that Dylan had been sending to her. Alice quickly broke off her relationship with Dylan when she heard of this infidelity. This, to all intents and purposes, was the perfect out. Dylan, however, denied he was talking to other women. He even tried to make Alice feel guilty for not believing him. Despite his apparent relationships with other women, Dylan was not prepared to let Alice go. With his control of Alice slipping away from him, he attempted to win her back. For weeks, he sent Alice a barrage of texts and emails. He called her relentlessly, and he even continued to speak with her friends and family. He sometimes sent her more than a hundred messages a day. Occasionally, he was sobbing uncontrollably throughout the voice messages that he sent to her. Alice, please. Alice, please, please, please. I can't do it. Alice, please call me back. Please. I just want to speak to you. There's nothing else. I don't even know if you're getting me some voice messages, but please, can you call me back? Thank you. The tone of his messages often changed quickly. Some were contrite and begging, while others were hostile and menacing. The intent, however, was always the same. Dylan wanted Alice back. No matter how many times he tried to contact her, Alice expressed no interest in rekindling her relationship with her ex-boyfriend. In the beginning, she tried to politely let him know that she had moved on. 
But after the messages escalated, Alice began ignoring Dylan's calls and texts. His obsession with Alice continued, however. He hacked into her social media accounts. This was so that he could keep track of where she was and who she might be talking with at any given moment. When Dylan learned that Alice had started a new relationship with another man, he tried to sabotage it by contacting her new love interest and lying about her. It's unknown if these lies worked. The stalking continued, however, and on September the 30th of 2016, Dylan went to Alice's home, ringing the doorbell numerous times. When she looked through the peephole and saw him standing there, she decided not to answer. Eventually though, he went to the back garden of Alice's ground floor flat. He then began knocking on the back window. After opening the curtain, she saw Dylan walking away. He had left behind chocolates and flowers, especially for her. While he made the trip home, he left another message for her. In this message, he said, After we spoke and he didn't want to speak, so he didn't want to call me again. So that's why I decided to come down to give you flowers and chocolates. Now I'm on my way back. If you want to take it, you can take it. If you want to bin it, you can bin it. It's completely up to you. I just wanted to do something just to say I'm sorry and I'm show that I'm really am sorry. And yeah, that's the least I could have done. But I know you're not going to come out in front of me and speak to me, so that's why I left it there. If you ever want to speak to me, it'll be good. If you don't, there's nothing I can do. Anyways, sorry for waking you up. Hope you have a good night's sleep. Bye. That scary message prompted Alice to reach out to Northumbria Police. Evening, Northumbria Police. Chris, I can help you. Hi there. Um, I just need a bit of advice, really, um, more than anything. Um, so I split up with my boyfriend about three months ago. Um, since then, I, I know that he's hacked into my Facebook and also my phone. Um, he's been sending me a lot of messages, even though I've asked him not to contact me. And um, basic, basically, like just messaging my friends and things. Um, and then tonight, he's um, well. I had a knock at my door. And, well, he'd, he'd sent me a message saying, I've been in the garden since five. I had a knock at my door. Um, and then when I went and looked, I've got like a little, you know, the thing that you can look through. Um, and there was no one there. And then it happened again um, two or three times. And then um, he's come around the back, knocked on my bedroom window at the back of my flat, it's the ground floor flat. Um, and he's been outside and he, he's like left... Um, some flowers and chocolates on the like outside window so I'm like he walked off he's not done anything but I'm just I'm concerned I've been putting off like my friends have been telling me to call the police I've been putting it off but it, I just feel a bit like shaken up tonight so well it's, it's it can be classed as harassment yeah which is a crime yeah if you know any contact from him there's a number of things you can do yeah. You could go to a solicitor and take out an injunction. Yeah. Keep them away from you. Yeah. Or report it directly at least now and we can issue them with a pin notice, which means if he ever comes near you again or contacts again, he'll be arrested. Okay. So which would you prefer? Can I um, try that option, please? Yeah, of course you can. I'll bet you need, please. Oh, sorry, um, it's Alice. So what's he called? Well, his name's Harry Dillon, um, but he's he's got like a a seat name which is Truman. Um, he lives in Edinburgh. In um. Ah, oh, he lives in Edinburgh. Yeah, so he's like driven down. So he's constantly contacting you by 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 phone or text or. Yeah. Um. Well, I've blocked his number. We've got two phones. I've blocked both numbers. Um. So he's been sending me Gmail messages. I haven't blocked him off Gmail because I don't want him to start emailing my work email. Then he's also made a fake Snapchat account to try and contact me on. I want me to get the Edinburgh Police to go and serve him with a pit and orders. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to see if we can make an appointment to come and see you. Yeah. In the morning. Yeah. And we'll get the details. Thank you.
Alice seemed almost embarrassed to contact the police about the behaviour of an ex-boyfriend. While a police information notice may sound intimidating, it carries essentially no consequences if broken. They are handed out to people who police believe may have done something wrong but something that they can't be arrested for, such as allegations of harassment. But the fact that Dylan would be told by the police to stop contacting her did give Alice a sense of comfort. She believed her ordeal might finally be ending, and now she could finally get on with her new life without her ex-boyfriend pursuing her. Dylan, who was still living at the military barracks near Edinburgh, was contacted on October the 3rd by the police about the police information notice. However, he wasn't arrested nor was he detained. While the police did speak with Dylan's superior, they did not contact the police in Scotland or the military police. Several people who knew Dylan and had heard about the police information notice told him to stop all contact with Alice but instead of listening to that advice given by his colleagues within days, Dylan sent Alice a package containing a letter and other items that reminded him of her. In the letter, Dylan said he would no longer be in Alice's life. It turns out the police information notice hadn't seemed to discourage Dylan from contacting Alice. Instead, it appeared to have made him angry. When Alice received the letter, some of her loved ones urged her to contact the police again to tell them that the contact and harassment hadn't stopped. So Alice contacted the police for a second time. Sorry, good evening, Northumbria. Please, Jeff, speaking, how can I help? Hi there. Um, Yeah, I've been in touch with the police. Um, um, uh, Somebody's been issued with a pen so that they they can't contact me. However, I've had had a letter off them. So you're uh, reporting like the breach, of, the breach of the pen? Yeah, yeah. And who was it from? Um, Harry Dillon. Uh, what was the content of the letter? Was he... So pictures of me and him, um, like, because uh, he's my ex-boyfriend, so like a, a notebook that I'd sent him when we were together and a letter. Okay, uh, and uh, so what was the con- what was the nature of it? Was it like threatening or was it harassing? Or... No, um, not threatening. It just it's just saying um, that he, he knows I called the police on him and he's had everything confiscated and all he has to himself is a pen and paper and an iPod and explaining why he came down last Friday. Um, and then um, it says at the bottom he won't contact, you know, this will be the last I hear from him, but he's, he's said that a lot of times and it, he, he never does seem to stop. So, so do you want to call back to discuss this? Yeah. What? What? What's usually what happens with it? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll let I'll, I'll uh, let them know you want to someone to contact you back just to discuss what can be done. Okay. Will it be the, the police officer that's been dealing with my case? Uh, I can't guarantee who it'll be. Um. I'll let. Well, I mean, I'll let them know you've got you've got your pen notice there, so it's it's, it's going into a breach of it. Um. Okay. Is the best time to phone you back? Um, any, any time really will be fine. The police call handler asked Alice to determine whether she wanted the police to arrest Dylan. This was instead of automatically arresting him for contacting her again, even after he had disregarded the instructions of the police information notice. Trying to be a nice person and not wanting to ruin Dylan's career, Alice said that she didn't want to have him arrested. She later made a comment to a loved one that she was palmed off by the authorities. Alice was frightened and convinced that Dylan would continue to stalk her. She thought there was nothing anyone could do to prevent it. To try and protect herself, Alice began taking precautions. She would have a work colleague drive her home every day and then she would lock her door as soon as she entered her flat. On October 12th, 2016, Dylan made the long drive to Alice's flat and parked near it, sitting there. He was simply biding his time until she returned. As he sat, he sent messages to another woman he was trying to meet up with later that same night. After Alice had returned, Dylan entered her flat by breaking into a rear window at around 6pm. He grabbed a sharp implement from her kitchen and cornered Alice in the bathroom. 
Alice fought valiantly for her life against this trained soldier. But ultimately, Dylan used the sharp implement against Alice, and there in her own flat, she drew her final breath. An amazing and promising life cut short in an instant. Dylan fled from the scene and Alice was found deceased a short time later by her flatmate Maxine. Maxine immediately contacted the Northumbria police to tell them what had happened to Alice. This is part of that real call. Please, I've just I've just come back to my flat and the door was locked so I crawled through the window and my flatmate's covered in blood in the bathroom. Is she breathing? I don't know, I can't, I can't look, I'm sorry. Okay, can't try, look. try and stay calm. Alice! 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 Oh my god, she's dead! She's dead! And yet the door was open. No, it wasn't open, it was locked, and I crawled through my window that was open in the back door, and she's lying covered in blood. She's, but she's blue. Can you have a look and see if she's breathing for the ambulance? She's not, she's not. She's not breathing? No, she looks. No. Where's the blood from? It's everywhere, I don't know. Her leg looks broken, everything. Say that again, sorry. Her leg looks broken, everything, I don't know. Alice! Alice! How much blood is there? There's lots, it's everywhere, it's everywhere. She was, at least if she was in the shower, she's... Everything to not go, it looks like she's been attacked. Please help. Uh, things have been tipped over in the bathroom. Yes, and everything so looks a mess, like she's not breathing, she's actually blue, please. I mean, you're just coming, I, I, I act as an absolute psychopath. Say that again, sorry. Uh, she's put in a complaint in about her ex, and she wrote 101 at the weekend to report that you started in contact, and she says we're going to do nothing, now this has happened. Right, who, who tried to contact her at the weekend? No, she's contacted 101 because she put in a statement about him two weeks ago. And they about said, you? Her ex-boyfriend, Harry Dillon. Right, so have they, she been having problems with her ex? Yes. So do you think this, that's what it is? Yeah, I can hear the police are coming. <laughs> yeah, they've seen the scene. I'll wait with you until they're actually with you. Thanks to Alice's prior calls to the police about Dylan's troubling behaviour and the additional information that was supplied by flatmate Maxine, the police quickly zoomed in on Dylan as a main person of interest. The police began searching for him right away. They found him just a few hours later after the attack. When he was located, he was trying to leave his barracks by scaling a wall. This was even though he claimed to know nothing of Alice's passings when he was found. The investigation into the incident, however, told a very different story to his. A medical examination revealed Alice's body had many bruises, as well as wounds located on her hands. These were determined to be from her trying to defend herself, bravely fighting for her life. In addition, forensic evidence tied Dylan to the scene. Alice's blood was found on the steering wheel of his car and on his bracelet. Dylan's story quickly changed when he realised there was a lot of evidence against him. Evidence that linked him to the scene and evidence that he had repeatedly threatened Alice. Even with the evidence mounting against him, Dylan was still determined to dodge any blame for the crime during his trial. Alice Ruggles was found um, at her home address in Gateshead and she'd been murdered. Mm -hmm. okay. Did you murder Alice? No, I did not murder Alice. Do you have any knowledge of this? No, I don't have any knowledge of this. Were you present when this murder occurred? No, I wasn't. I not told exactly what happened to her. And how you, you, cut her throat. No comment. Are you looking back? Are you? No. Do you remember what happened? No comment. Do you remember what you did? Do you remember how bad it was? Do you remember the blood spraying? No comment. I'm being told that you suffered. She must have known what was happening. Because she didn't die straight away. You've got four tiny little scratches on your face. Her throat is slit open through the voice box. Sarah, you for two days. She had no remorse whatsoever. You said you loved her. You didn't love her. You thought if you can't have her, no one else can have her. That's exactly what you thought. Because she doesn't want you. Is that the truth? No comment. Why are you no comment now? Because you're guilty. 
How can you do that to someone you love? Because you're jealous, possessive, controlling, stalker, murderer. He concocted an unlikely scenario to avoid spending any time in prison. He said that she threatened him with a sharp implement and she was therefore accidentally cut by it when they were arguing. But the forensic evidence did not support Dylan's versions of the events, especially when it was factored in that he was much taller and heavier than she was. It was also determined that Alice had 24 injuries on her body. Further evidence showed Dylan's footmark on the bathroom door. This was an indication that he had fought his way into the bathroom where Alice was hiding from him. In his court trial, Dylan did not display any emotion about Alice's passing. Other evidence came to light which cast doubt on Dylan's tale. It came out during the trial that he had driven to Alice's house on October the 10th, and whilst there he had taken a picture of the bathroom window at the back of her flat. That showed the jury that he had ill intent towards Alice, and that he had planned his actions ahead of time. The jury also learned that Alice wasn't the first person that Dylan had stalked and verbally harassed. Before he began dating Alice, he dated a woman named Aniko Nemeth. When she broke things off with him, he tracked her down. He spat at her and called her degrading names. The police were subsequently notified and Dylan received a restraining order. This required him to stay away from Nemeth for one year. Unfortunately, Alice had known nothing about Dylan's inability to move on. His romantic relationships ended, but he refused to accept it. Alice didn't know that Dylan had handled rejection so badly in the past that another woman was forced to protect herself against him. In the end, the jury didn't believe Dylan's story about Alice allegedly attacking him. Although the guilty verdict was a big relief to Alice's parents and other family members, they realised that there were other women who were dealing with situations like Alice had. Looking back to their first meeting with Dylan, her parents said that they saw nothing in his behaviour that would have suggested he would later become violent towards their daughter. They also understood that their daughter may have survived if police officers did more to help women who are being stalked. While they couldn't bring Alice back, they hoped they could implement changes that could someday save other young women. Working with the police, they helped develop a protocol for processing stalking and harassment allegations. Alice's parents started a trust in which they could teach others about the threat of stalking and help other women who may be in danger. Dylan was found guilty and he was sentenced to a minimum of 22 years in prison. I don't know. Okay. I don't think I got all of this. I don't know. Rolf Tieder was born in Germany on September the 29th, 1939. He immigrated to the United States with his mother when he was 11 years old. Kay Tidwell was born in Nevada on January the 16th, 1941, to her parents Eugene and Beth Tidwell. Rolf and Kay got married on May the 24th, 1963, in Salt Lake City, Utah, but soon moved to Humboldt, Texas. The newlyweds were active and devout members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and they had dreams of starting a big family. Unfortunately though, they struggled to get pregnant, therefore they adopted their first child, a daughter named Lene. Three years later, they adopted their son Sean, but within just a few weeks of this adoption, the Tida family realised that Kay was now two months pregnant with a baby girl they named Trisha. At this time, Rolf had been working as a salesman. He was soon able to open his business, Skyline Equipment Incorporated, in Houston, Texas in 1969. The Tida family owned a remote cabin in Oakley, Utah, a cabin they would visit every year around Christmas. They referred to the cabin as Tida's Tranquility. This was because it was in such a remote and peaceful location and they had formed so many fond holiday memories there. In the 1990s, Oakley, Utah only had a population of around 600 people. 
it was known to be a very, very safe place. In fact, in the previous 100 years, there had only been one violent crime in that area. This was a shooting that was the result of road rage. The Tida's cabin was located 4 kilometers, roughly 2.5 miles, from the nearest road, so the family could only access it by parking their car on the road and riding a snowmobile to the cabin. So, just like they did every holiday season, the Tida's planned a trip to the cabin in December of 1990. On December the 20th, Kay and Sean flew from Texas to Utah. At the airport, they met up with Kay's sister, Claudia, who was waiting there to give them a ride. Rolf and his two daughters planned to fly in the next day and meet up with the others. So Kay, Sean and Claudia drove to the cabin and parked the car. They loaded all of their belongings onto the snowmobiles and then headed to the cabin. When they were around halfway to the cabin, the trio passed a man. They described him as being in his 20s and only wearing tennis shoes, jeans and a light jacket. This was despite the below freezing temperatures and the rough terrain on the snowy mountainsides. Kay decided to stop and make sure the man was okay, asking if he needed any help. The man didn't even acknowledge them, however. He just walked away without saying anything. Kay, Sean and Claudia didn't think too much of the interaction. They continued up the mountain to the cabin. After unloading their supplies, the three had dinner together, and Claudia then decided to spend the night with them in the cabin. The following day, Rolf arrived with his two daughters, Lene, who was 22 at the time, and Trisha, who was now 16. Before Rolf and the girls headed up on a snowmobile, Kay told Rolf about the strange interaction with the man the previous day. She asked Rolf if he could bring the shotguns with him when they came. Rolf, however, didn't think this was necessary. He reminded Kay of how safe the area actually was. But Kay insisted and Rolf finally agreed. That same morning, Claudia left the cabin to go into town. There, she planned to do some last-minute Christmas shopping before the family party in a few days. Once the rest of the family arrived to the cabin, they spent their time wrapping presents. They set up the Christmas tree and stockings, and they prepared for the party ahead. But soon, they also went into town to stock up on some more supplies. Once they finished their errands in town and were about to head back to the cabin, Sean decided that he wanted to spend the night at his Aunt Claudia's house. So the family dropped him off before then heading to Kay's mother, Beth's home, where the rest of the family would be spending the night. Kay's mother, Beth Potts, was 72 years old at the time. She was said to always be in good spirits. This was despite losing much of her eyesight and a good deal of her mobility after a car accident in 1983. The following day, December 22nd, at around noon, Kay, Lene and Beth headed back to the cabin. When the trio arrived, Kay noticed a shadow through the master bedroom window. She was excited, thinking her cousin David had arrived to the cabin early to surprise the family. Lene ran inside the cabin to warm up her hands under some hot water. She now noticed the figure inside the cabin, this time from behind the refrigerator. Lene laughed to herself, waiting for her mother's cousin David to pop out from behind the fridge and surprise her. However, it was not David behind the fridge. And the next thing Lene knew, a man with frizzy hair was standing in front of her, pointing a firearm directly at her. The man forced Lene to call her mother and grandmother upstairs. And as Kay helped Beth up the stairs, another intruder appeared. He was described as wearing thick glasses. The second man held a gun to Kay and Beth. Kay pleaded with the men, telling them she would give them anything if they would just let her family live. But without hesitation, the frizzy-haired man turned his gun on Kay. He immediately pulled the trigger. He then did the same to Beth, once in the head and again in the back when she tried to get up. The two men dragged Lene into one of the bedrooms. There, they duct-taped a sock into her mouth and tied up her hands and feet. 
the man with glasses then brought the family dog into the room with Lene. They then went back out to Kay and Beth's bodies. There they took any jewellery and money that was on them, before then bringing the bodies to the patio and covering them in snow. At around 2.45 that afternoon, Rolf and Trisha arrived at the cabin. When they pulled up, the man with the frizzy hair held a firearm to Lene. They forced her out to the front of the cabin. While the man with the thick glasses held Rolf and Trisha at gunpoint, they forced them to empty their pockets. Rolf gave the man $105 in cash that he had in his pockets, and he pleaded with them to take anything they wanted. The man holding Lene ordered the other to kill Rolf. The man with the glasses cocked his gun, but couldn't bring himself to pull the trigger. The man with the frizzy hair then turned his gun to Rolf and attempted to pull the trigger, but his gun didn't fire. He tried another time, and again it didn't go off. But the third time he pulled the trigger, the gun fired whilst it was pointed at Rolf's face. The two men then took the Teeter's gas cans they used to fill up their snowmobiles and poured gasoline all over the cabin. This was their attempt to destroy evidence by setting the house on fire. After covering the cabin in gasoline, the two men went back out to Rolf. One aimed their gun at the back of his head and pulled the trigger, before covering his body in gasoline as well. After setting the cabin on fire, the men instructed Lene and Trisha to load their stolen valuables onto the snowmobiles and drive them down to the road. This was the location where the family's cars were parked. While the four of them headed back down the mountain, they happened to pass the girl's uncle, Randy. He assumed that the girls knew the two boys with them. Randy waved at them, but the girls ignored him, thinking that if the men knew that Randy was part of their family, they would try to murder him too. Once they got to the family's Lincoln Town car that was parked on the road, the men ordered the girls to load the items from the snowmobiles into the trunk. The men told them that they were going to drive the car to New York and that they would let the girls go once they arrived there. However, understandably, Lene and Trisha did not believe the men. But they also felt that they didn't have any other choice but to go along with their plan. When the four of them got into the car and began driving, they passed the girl's uncle Randy again. He was also driving down the road. He was motioning to the girls and yelling at them to stop, but they continued to ignore him. When the men asked if they knew Randy, the girls maintained that they didn't know him, hoping that this would save his life. Randy, however, could tell something was very wrong. Not long after the girls and their captors passed Randy, a man on a snowmobile started coming towards him. He noticed that the man was not dressed for the below freezing temperatures. He was not wearing a helmet, shoes or a jacket. He also noticed that the man had injuries to his face. As the man got closer, Randy could see that his face was swollen and crimson. Once the man on the snowmobile caught up to Randy, he got off and started to approach him. That is when he realised that the injured man was his brother, Rolf. Rolf filled Randy in on the events that had just happened. He told Randy that, after he was shot and doused in gasoline, he laid on the ground and pretended to be dead, waiting for the men to leave. Once he heard the snowmobiles leave, he went to the cabin and tried to put out the fire, but he said it was spreading so quickly that he couldn't do it, and in the process, part of his clothing even ended up catching fire whilst he was in there. Randy placed Rolf in the back seat of his car and sped down the road. He was trying to call 911, but the reception was too poor in this remote part of town. His call, luckily though, was eventually able to connect. He then told the 911 operator everything that had just happened. He told them where the girls went, what car they were in, and requested a helicopter for his injured brother. He amazingly managed to get all of this out before his phone died. Randy then pulled into a gas station to use their payphone to call 911 once again. While this was happening, the girls were riding in their stolen car with the men. A police car then passed them and made a U-turn to start following. This made the men nervous and resulted in them starting a high-speed police chase. However, the car eventually spun out and got stuck on a snowbank. 
Luckily, the two men surrendered to the police without too much issue. Meanwhile, a helicopter managed to get to Rolf and bring him to the hospital. There, amazingly, he was able to recover completely. When the police were able to make it to the cabin, they described the scene as a war zone. Among the mess, they found a videotape that had been recorded by the two killers. This showed how they passed their time in the house before the family returned. Before the Tida family arrived, the two men had spent some time in the cabin eating food opening presents and looking for valuables. This is the real footage that they captured themselves with the Tida family's camcorder. I don't know. Okay. I don't think I got all of this. I don't know. How am I supposed to find out? What is it? Baseball card. Okay. Let's see a couple of them. Oh, the football and basketball. And Show them this way. Turn them this way. Okay. Next page. The police were able to identify the perpetrators as 22 year old Edward Deli. This was the man wearing the thick glasses. And 26 year old Von Taylor, who was the man with the frizzy hair. The pair met when they were in a halfway house together after being released from prison for unrelated crimes of aggravated burglary and arson. The two left the halfway house before their official release date and they then hitchhiked to Oakley. This was because Von Taylor's father also happened to own a cabin in the area. They spent the week before the Teeter family's murders burglarising other houses nearby. They even scoped out the Teeter's cabin on December the 20th. Von Taylor was the man that Kay was suspicious of the day that she was riding a snowmobile with Claudia and Sean. On January the 22nd of 1991, the two men were arraigned. They were each charged with two counts of first degree murder one count of attempted first degree murder and two counts of aggravated kidnapping, aggravated assault, theft, arson and failure to heed a police signal. Both Von Taylor and Edward Deli pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Five months later, Taylor pleaded guilty to the two counts of capital murder in exchange for the other charges being dropped. He was sentenced to death for both counts. Edward, however, did not plead guilty and went to trial two weeks after Taylor was sentenced. His defence was that Taylor was the ringleader and told Delhi what to do. His lawyer supported this defence by showing that Delhi refused to kill Rolf when Taylor told him to, and that he tried to comfort Lene by bringing a dog into the room with her. After 12 hours of deliberation, the jury decided that Edward Deli was guilty of second degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole. Neither Edward Deli nor Von Taylor knew that Rolf had survived the attack. They were, to say the least, very surprised to see him standing in the courtroom. Brembate de Sopra is a small and picturesque town. It is four miles northwest of the city of Bergamo in northern Italy. With just 8,000 residents, it is a humble town, with homes still using wood burning stoves, raising chickens, and growing their own vegetables. Among this rural community lived the Gambarazio family. Fulvio, an architect, and his wife Mara, a teacher, had lived there all of their lives. Their families had been in the area for generations. Fulvio and Mara had four children. The eldest was daughter Kiba, aged 15, Yara, who was 13, and then two younger sons, Naiten and Jia Lee. Yara was passionate about gymnastics. She enjoyed school. 
and she loved being with her siblings. Now a teenage girl, she was known for her dark curly hair. She always wore it free and wild, unless that is, she was at gymnastics. At gymnastics, Yara was a different person. She was poised, composed and measured. This was far from the happy, carefree soul that she was day to day. But she loved her sport and she had hopes and dreams of being the very best. At 13 years old, she had all of the time in the world to make those dreams a reality. On Friday the 26th of November 2010, it was just another Friday in the small town. Yara was gearing up for a gymnastics competition that weekend. She'd been practicing her routine almost endlessly. To do this, she had borrowed her instructor, Sylvia's stereo, to use at home. She knew that she needed to return it before the weekend. And at 5.15pm on Friday, she left her home for the sports centre to go and meet Sylvia. At this time, the weather was cold and there was snow in the air. The sports centre was just 700 metres from Yara's house. This was a route that Yara had walked alone hundreds of times. It took only 10 minutes at the very maximum. The sports centre was a large building, very much like a school. It had a big gate, multiple entrances, tennis courts, a running track and a swimming pool. Once there, Yara returned the stereo to Sylvia and then caught up with a few of her friends before doing a training session. It was the big competition that weekend after all. An extra half an hour of practice could make all the difference. She finished up and left the sports centre building at around 6.45pm. Shortly after, she sent a text message to her friend Martina, arranging to meet on Sunday at 8am. Mother Mara didn't expect her to be gone for very long, so waiting at home, she kept a close eye on the clock. By 7pm, she had grown worried. The need to get Yara home safe and warm was made more immediate. The snow outside was getting heavier, the conditions growing more extreme by the minute. And besides the weather, Yara definitely should have been home by now. At 7.11pm, the mother phoned Yara's phone. However, the call went straight to voicemail. After checking the sports centre to no avail, 20 minutes later, Yara's father made the decision to call the police. The call was put through to the public prosecutor's office in Bergamo. There, the prosecutor on duty was Letitia Rigeri. She was a tough former policewoman who had earned respect within the force. She worked against the Sicilian Mafia in Sicily in southern Italy. She also didn't waste any time and within five minutes of receiving the call, she had dispatched both state police officers and the Carabinieri military police to the village. The family was understandably already fraught with worry. People came out of their houses to help search for Yara. The fire department walked the banks of the river. Police and volunteers searched the nearby fields, abandoned buildings, and asked passers-by if they'd seen any sign of Yara. The sports centre too was searched inside and out. Dogs were used to track the path where Yara had walked. However, these dogs didn't follow the path back to Yara's home. Instead, they trailed off towards Mapello. This was a small hamlet three kilometres in the opposite direction. By this time, the team had been able to analyse the last signals from Yara's mobile phone. Her phone had shown a signal in Mapello at 6.49pm, back on the evening of her disappearance. This was five minutes after Yara had sent a text message to her friend Martina. This means Yara, or at least her phone, must have travelled by car to where it was last pinged in Mapello. Yara obviously couldn't drive, so who was she with? Had she simply taken a taxi ride? Had she maybe run away with a friend? Or, the most sinister option, had Yara been kidnapped, taken against her will? Surveillance video footage was released. It showed a vehicle driving past the sports centre. It was a small white utility vehicle with an open back. We call them flatbeds in the UK. This vehicle was captured driving past around the time of Yara's disappearance. 
The same vehicle was also shown to pass several more times on other days leading up to Yara going missing. Frustratingly, no registration plate was able to be identified on the footage, so instead police released images of the vehicle itself, all in the hope that either the owner would come forward or someone else who recognised the vehicle would come forward instead. However, no one did, and the case went cold over Christmas. This investigation was at a dead end. On the 25th of February 2011, three months after Yara went missing, investigators finally had a breakthrough. A local man had recently bought a remote-controlled aeroplane. He was still learning how to fly it, so he found an open field in a small town around six miles from where Yara was last seen. This was somewhere where the man felt he could fly his plane freely. This area is surrounded by industrial estates, spare lots and fields. As he flew the remote-controlled aircraft, he discovered that it wasn't quite working properly, so he landed it amongst some tall grass. As he walked over to pick it up, he saw what he thought were some rags and rubbish on the ground. However, as he got closer, he was met with a harrowing sight. He saw shoes, girls' shoes and a body. It was frozen and partly degraded. This was sadly the body of Yara Gambirazio. Now I know what you're probably thinking, how did it take three months to find Yara's body? She was found just 10 kilometers from her home, and this field had already been searched in the days after Yara's disappearance, so things didn't quite add up. The police speculated that the killer dumped her body after watching them search the area. Still nearby to the body, they found Yara's iPod and house keys. They found the SIM card and battery for her LG phone, but the phone itself was missing. The autopsy found she had suffered a head injury, possibly inflicted with a rock and several blows to the body. She had also been jabbed at with a sharp implement numerous times but it was determined that she didn't actually pass from these lacerations, nor from the loss of vital fluids. Yara had instead died from exposure to cold weather after she lost consciousness. There were also traces of lime in Yara's respiratory tract, and the presence of a vegetable fibre used to make rope on Yara's clothing. The killer may have worked in the building trade. And this wasn't all the killer left behind. Male DNA was found in Yara's underwear. I know what you're probably imagining this DNA sample was. However, from the available information, it was in fact the male's blood. This led police to the theory that it was likely that the attacker had attempted to violate Yara. However, the strong gymnast put up a good fight, or possibly his intentions were interrupted in some other way. Regardless, the police had something solid to go on. The killer was given a nickname, Unknown One. They now had their man, but they still had to find him. The search for Unknown One included a secret team of eight special agents. They asked for volunteers to submit DNA samples to help catch Yara's killer. Classmates, families of classmates, friends and members of the community all came forward. A staggering 22,000 people from the area volunteered their DNA. DNA matching was slow work. It took different geneticists in Parma, Pavia and Rome a minimum of six hours to transform just a few samples of DNA into something which could be read and compared. The cost of materials and manpower made this investigation one of the most expensive manhunts in Italian history. Investigators eventually made a breakthrough. They found one person who volunteered their DNA closely resembled the prime suspect, Unknown One. He was a 20-year-old man named Damiano Corioni. Damiano was quickly excluded as a suspect. He had been in South America when Yara disappeared and his DNA wasn't an exact match. However, it was clear that he was a close blood relative of Unknown One. Ruggeri and her team were ecstatic, feeling that it would only be a matter of days before they would have the murderer behind bars. The team tracked down Damiano's family and found out that his mother, Aurora, 
had worked for Yara's family for 10 years as a housemaid. Aurora lived nearby and had been at Yara's house twice a week since she was a baby. In fact, Aurora and Yara were very close, and Yara always asked her for advice on her gymnastics routines. Aurora, who was very protective of Yara, was forever telling her to be careful. When investigators questioned her, she said it was the worst thing that had ever happened to her. She said she was completely distraught, but she also said that she wasn't responsible. Aurora was subsequently cleared and the team turned their focuses to Damiano's father. He had a brother, Giuseppe Quariano, who had died in 1999. The team contacted his widow, Laura. He found an envelope with a stamp on it in a box of documents that had belonged to her husband. Giuseppe had been the one to lick this stamp, which left his DNA behind. They were able to confirm it was Giuseppe who had licked the stamps, and his DNA sequence was an even closer match to Unknown One than Damiano's was. Giuseppe was the father of Unknown One. The team started to build a picture of Giuseppe and his family. Giuseppe and Laura had three children, a daughter and two sons. DNA checks showed that neither son was unknown one, so that left only one possibility. Somewhere out there was the illegitimate son of Giuseppe. Police were near to making a complete U-turn in their investigation. Instead of searching for a man, they were searching for a woman. The killer's mother, a woman possibly in her 60s, who had an affair with Giuseppe decades earlier. She then got pregnant and went on to have Giuseppe's son, who then went on to kill Yara. There were 532 women listed as possibly being the mother of Unknown One. The team began the task of tracking down each one of these women. As police conducted their own hunts for the mother of Unknown One, the villages surrounding Bergamo were searched. Conversations and whispers led police from one house to the next. One by one, they spoke to each woman on their list of over 500. By this stage, it was June of 2014. This was three and a half years since Yara had first disappeared. The chance of this killer still being in the hilltop villages of Lombardy seemed unlikely. However, police were persistent, and one day they finally got a name. It was finally given reluctantly in a whisper. Esther Azul. In the late 1960s, Esther had been Giuseppe's neighbour. She married a man named Giovanni Bassetti from a nearby village. Esther and Giovanni lived in Brembate di Sopra, the small village Yara had lived in and disappeared from. Esther denied ever having an affair with Giuseppe, but the police knew that her sons were born in the right period of time, meaning that she was probably lying. One son was quickly ruled out, but the other, Massimo Bassetti, was a 42-year-old married father of three, and he lived in Mapello, the very place where the last signal from Yara's phone had pinged. He was a bricklayer nicknamed the animal by his friends. When he was younger, he was known to love partying. He was short and thin with piercing blue eyes and a peroxide pencil goatee. Within a few days, the investigators decided the best approach would be to set up a roadblock near his house for random breath testing. This way, they could collect his DNA without him suspecting anything. Massimo was driving home with his wife and three children when he was stopped by police. The officer knew exactly what he was doing. He pretended the first breath test didn't work and so he performed a second one. The officers now had two sets of Massimo's DNA and Massimo had no idea this seemingly innocent random breath test was actually a test to confirm if he had murdered Yara. The following day on the 16th of June 2014, Ruggeri received the call she had been waiting for. Massimo Passetti was unknown one. On the 16th of June 2014, the very same day, Massimo was arrested whilst working on a local construction site. He had no prior criminal record, he denied any involvement in the crime, and he said that he was altogether innocent. 
The last piece of the puzzle fell into place when the investigators matched Massimo's vehicle to the small white utility vehicle that had been spotted on CCTV all those years earlier. Massimo argued that he just happened to drive by the sports centre on his way home from work that day. However, police were able to confirm that he didn't work that day at all. Investigators used telephone records, surveillance video, along with testimony from colleagues to prove he was lying. They finally had their man. The trial commenced on Friday the 3rd of June 2015. Massimo had not moved from his claims of innocence. People were surprised that, facing such clear DNA evidence against him, he still claimed that he was not the guilty party. His wife testified he was home having dinner with her and their kids at the time of the murder. The trial would include 60,000 pages of records of inquiries, and 120 witnesses were called to testify for the prosecution. Massimo's defence said that they had 711 witnesses, as well as about 50 experts and consultants. However, the court made them cut this down to a total of 160 people. Sylvia Brenner, who was Yara's gym instructor that lent her the stereo, faced scrutiny at the trial when she became a focus of Massimo's defence team. On the night of Yara's disappearance, Sylvia's father confirmed that Sylvia had cried all night with no explanation. She also could not explain why she and her brother had sent text messages to each other at the time of Yara's disappearance, messages which they almost immediately deleted but strangely they hadn't deleted any other of their messages. A bombshell was then dropped in the courtroom, something that had never come out before the trial. This was the very reason why Sylvia became the defence team's hot ticket. The forensics lab noticed what they called dark halos, indicating the presence of blood on the sleeve cuffs of Yara's jacket and when testing the stain they discovered the DNA belonged to Sylvia. It was confirmed that there was no way for this DNA to have been left as contact DNA, and after three months in the element, it had to have been a significant fluid, such as blood. Sylvia was criticised for answering I don't know to at least 10 questions on the witness stand. This included how her DNA got onto Yara's sleeve cuff. Ruggeri and her team examined Massimo's computer after his arrest, and what they found painted a harrowing picture of a man who was interested in young girls. Massimo also regularly hung out around Yara's home, as well as a sports centre where Yara trained. He was seen on security footage circling the gym on different days. He would park nearby on some occasions. His phone was also found to have been in the area many times in the lead up to Yara's disappearance. It was even nearby on the afternoon that she disappeared. Massimo had switched his phone off at 5.45pm the day that Yara vanished, and he did not switch it back on until 7.30am the following morning. A local woman testified that at around 7pm on the day Yara disappeared, she was taking out the garbage at her home. Whilst outside, she saw a vehicle matching Massimo's pass by at high speed. She said she saw a young person inside, but she was unsure if it was a boy or a girl. She said she heard screaming coming from the vehicle, and it was cut off mid-scream. She went to the police and gave them this information as soon as she heard of Yara's disappearance. On the 1st of July 2016, Massimo Pacetti was found guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Yara. Although Sylvia's DNA being found on Yara's cuff was an explosive development and something the defence relied upon heavily, Sylvia was never a suspect. She was investigated thoroughly and subsequently cleared. Massimo has tried to appeal his conviction multiple times since 2016, but each of them has been thrown out. Yara's killer will never see freedom again. He's a kind, gentle person, loving person. Yeah, well, I didn't do that. Oh. He will never take another person's life. Karina Ann Vitrano was born on July the 12th, 1986 in New York City. 
She grew up with two loving parents as well as two siblings, ones who valued integrity and servitude. Her mother, Catherine, was a nurturer looking after the home and the children, and her father, Phil, was a retired firefighter. He was one of the first responders during the 9-11 attacks. This upbringing is why Karina, after graduating from Archbishop Malloy High School and attending St John's University, became a speech pathologist for children with special needs. Karina pursued a career where she was in service to others, but she never let her big dreams die. She was also an aspiring writer and an avid world traveller. She loved to write blog posts about her travels and her thoughts about the world. Poetry, musings and ideas flowed from Karina. She was a thoughtful person and she wasn't afraid to show it or share it with the world. In 2013, she even featured in a short film, The Paradox, directed by a friend that was inspired by her writings. Throughout her aspirations, she never lost the close connection she had with her family. In fact, she moved into the same neighbourhood as them in Queens, and she went on frequent jogs with her father through the parks. Unfortunately, it would be this bonding experience that would ultimately forever change all of their lives. Queens, New York is a borough in New York City which is diverse and dynamic. It's known for its rich cultural diversity. Queens is home to residents from all over the world. This makes it a melting pot of languages, of cultures and traditions. With neighbourhoods ranging from bustling urban centres to peaceful residential areas, Queens offers a little something for pretty much everyone. Its attractions include Flushing Meadows Corona Park, the Unisphere and a variety of museums. Altogether, this makes it a vibrant and exciting place to live and to visit. It is here where Karina's family would grow close and thrive. That is, until August the 2nd, 2016. For years, Karina and her father had shared a cherished evening routine. They went on their jogs and bonded through it. However, on this day, their well-established tradition was interrupted. Her father had recently suffered a back injury and was unable to join her. Concerned for her safety, Karina's father asked her not to go. However, she offered soothing words of reassurance, saying that she would be fine. With a parting smile, Karina ventured out. She left at around 5pm to embark on their familiar jogging route. But over an hour later, as the Vetrano family home grew quiet, Father Phil's worry for Karina had become intense. He couldn't shake the growing unease, a sense of something being wrong that gnawed away at him. Karina should have returned by now, but as minutes turned into hours, his worries deepened. Desperate for a sign that she was okay, Philip reached for his phone and sent a text message to Karina. However, the notification remained unanswered. Mother Catherine joined him in his concern, but they still hung on to the hope that their daughter might have made an unexpected stop. Maybe she visited friends or she got caught up in conversation. But as the skies darkened and more calls and text messages went unanswered, their parental instincts caused them to take action. Father Phil's instinctual response was to reach out to a neighbour. He was someone with experience in law enforcement. As it turned out, the neighbour was a New York City police chief, and he thankfully immediately answered Phil's request for help in searching for Karina. The community railed together, guided by Philip. They retraced the familiar jogging route, but after a while of searching along the path, Karina's helpless father made a chilling, life-changing discovery. Within a few feet from the jogging path, Karina's lifeless body was discovered. She was laying face down in the weeds, her hand gripping the grass beneath her. She was now only partially dressed and her body bore evident signs of violence in the form of scratches and bruises. This distressing scene was a stark illustration of a gruesome crime. The wave of shock and grief that hit her family was profound. Her mother, Catherine, couldn't contain her sorrow. 
She ran through the streets with her cries echoing through the neighbourhood. This discovery marks the beginning of a rigorous investigation into the circumstances surrounding Karina's passing. No one could fathom who would want to hurt a beautiful helping hand in the world who came from such a heroic family. The autopsy results left no room for doubt. Karina Vetrano had been throttled. Her passing was declared a clear case of homicide. The examination revealed harrowing evidence of violence. She had been struck in the back of the head with a rock. It was clear she had fiercely struggled to fight for her life. She had bitten her assailant with such force that her teeth were cracked. Her hands still gripping the grass was evidence of her being dragged from the path. The marks on her neck were so severe that her handprint was left behind. This showed the full force of the assault. It was clear that Karina had fought for her life with everything that she had, gasping for breath as she attempted to hit, scratch, kick and punch her assailant. Unfortunately, her fight proved to not be enough. Karina, innocently going on a run, had fallen victim to a senseless crime. The response of her family to this tragedy was swift and determined, and the public were left wondering how they could keep women safe when they were out and alone. An award for information was announced, and a task force of 100 detectives was assembled to unravel this disturbing mystery. The search for answers began with DNA recovery in key locations. This was Karina's neck, where she had been throttled, under her fingernails reflecting the struggle against her attacker, and on her discarded cell phone which had been carelessly tossed into the weeds nearby. However, despite these valuable clues, there were no matches to any individuals on the police's database. This only deepened the mystery. The tireless effort to solve the crime would involve examining 600 DNA samples, each one inched closer to finding the person responsible for this horrific act. The investigation continued to be a painstaking and heart-wrenching process. Police investigators reviewed more than 1,700 investigative reports. They left no stone unturned as they followed over 250 leads in their quest for answers. As the investigation continued, the NYPD took a significant step by releasing a sketch. It was of a man deemed a possible witness in the homicide of Karina Vetrano. They hoped this would finally bring them closer to solving this case. However, their tireless efforts would yield no results. Investigators grew weary and all leads led to dead ends. As the case grew colder, Queen's County District Attorney Richard A. Brown took a significant step in December of 2016. He requested authorization from the state to employ familial DNA testing in the investigation. This would involve running the DNA profile from the crime scene through the state database. This was to identify any potential links to similar profiles belonging to relatives. This process focused on the DNA testing of Y chromosomes. They are found in males only. Meanwhile, the GoFundMe page established by the Vetrano family, with the aim of providing a reward fund for anyone with valuable information, had now earned over $290,000 in donations. The community's support remained steadfast as they sought justice for Karina Vetrano. As the investigation dragged on with no strong leads, many of the officers began to lose hope. But in January of 2017, Lieutenant John Russo remembered something, something that gave him the feeling that they had a new lead. He remembered a call that he had made to the police. This was regarding a man spotted in his own Howard Beach neighbourhood, all the way back in May the previous year whilst he was off duty. The suspicious character had been wearing a hooded sweatshirt in warm weather. It appeared as though he was canvassing the area for possible robberies. As Russo noticed this man, he decided to employ the see something, say something mantra, so he called it in. 
Russo knew that this detail was minuscule, but he was grabbing onto anything he had left to aid in the investigation. With a sense of urgency, Russo had sought out the police officers who had responded to his 911 call. He hoped that they still had their notes from this dispatch. As he poured over their notes, they revealed that officers had arrived on the scene and they did indeed locate this individual. They spoke with him and took down his identifying information in case of any future incidents. The reports from May of 2016 read that the name of this suspicious man was Chanel Lewis. He was a 20-year-old man with no criminal record. A deeper look into his past would reveal that, at one point, he had expressed disturbing thoughts to a teacher. He revealed his desire to harm the girls at his school. Lewis was often described as a loner, which, coupled with his reported instability, added to the complexity of his profile. Although his criminal record remained clean, he had had some encounters with law enforcement. Lewis had found himself on the radar of the police on several occasions. He received summons for violating rules and for public urination. These seemingly minor offences now took on a different significance in their ongoing investigation. It didn't take long for police to locate Lewis. There they spoke with him and with his consent, they obtained a DNA sample like they had done with hundreds of others. The breakthrough in the Karina Vetrano case came when on February 2nd, 2017, it was found that Chanel Lewis's DNA did indeed match the samples found under Karina's nails and on her cell phone. This evidence was overwhelming. On February 4th, 2017, Lewis was brought in for questioning at the 107th precinct. After hours of interrogation, Lewis finally confessed to the crimes. This confession was recorded at the precinct in the presence of a prosecutor. Approximately 10.33 a.m. And I'm activating the tape this time. Okay, we're present in the 107th police precinct. The date is Sunday, February 5th. 2017, and the time is about 10.33 a.m. My name is Peter McCormick. I'm an assistant DA in and for the county of Queens. Present in the room with me at this time are Detective Barry Brown, ADA Michael Curtis, video technician Joseph Deal, and Chanel Lewis. Okay, Chanel, I'm about to be reading you your rights. After that, if you agree to speak with me, you may, if you wish, make a statement about and answer questions about an incident that occurred on August 2nd, 2016. Even though I've already spoken to someone else, you do not have to talk to us. I'm going to now read you your rights. You have the right to remain silent and refuse to answer questions. Do you understand? Yes. Anything you do say may be used against you in a court of law. Do you understand? Yes. You have the right to consult with an attorney before speaking to me or to the police and to have an attorney present during any questioning now or in the future. Do you understand? Yes. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you without cost. Do you understand? Yes. If you do, if you do not have an attorney available, you have the right to remain silent until you have had an opportunity to consult with one. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. Now that I advise you of your rights, are you willing to answer questions? Okay. Yes? Okay. All right. All right, Chanel, why don't we start with, uh, I think it was a Tuesday evening on August 2nd, um, 2016. Do you remember that, that date and that evening? Mm-hmm. All right. And where were you at that time? Mm-hmm. I, was at, I was in Spring Creek, uh, Gateway and Spring Creek Mall. Okay, by Gateway and Spring Creek Mall? Uh, Spring Creek Park. Park? Yeah. All right. Were you inside the park? Yeah. Okay. And was anyone with you or were you by yourself? By myself. All right. About what time did you get to the park? About five o'clock. All right. And how did you enter the park? From what street? From, you know, where, uh, where uh, oh yeah, the Bell Parkway. From where the, from where the Bell Parkway entrance is to yeah. the park? All right. And what kind of park is this? What does it look like inside? Are the trees, grass, pensions? More like large grass. High grass? 
Are there any trails in the park? Mm-hmm. Okay. And were you on a trail or were you in the grass? On the trail. Okay. What kind of trail is it? Paved or dirt or what? It's kind of like a dirt. Mm-hmm. Okay. About what time would you say you got to the park that night? That that evening? Oh, five. Okay. What was the, what was the weather like? Was it rainy, cloudy, sunny? <coughs> like it rained like in the morning and then it got, got sunny in the evening. Okay. And um, while you were in the park, well, do you remember what you were wearing that day? It was a hoodie, a sweatpants, and a shoes. Okay. What color was the hoodie? Do you remember? Most likely brown. Mm -hmm. And the sweatpants? I think it's probably black. All right. And the shoes, were they shoes or sneakers? Sneakers. Okay. Do you remember what color they were? What kind? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, while you were in the park, um, did something happen? Yes. What happened while you were in the park? While well, in the park, we were just girl jogging, and then, I, then I, you know, one thing led to another because we okay. some other situation. All right. Well, the girl that was jogging, was she by herself or with anybody else? By herself. Um, what did she look like? What was she wearing? She looked like she was wearing a yellow tank top, maybe. Okay. What kind of pants? I wouldn't really know. Were they long or short? Do you remember? No. Do you remember if they were long pants or short pants? No. Mm. Okay. Um, and was she, was she jogging? Was she coming from the same direction that you came from when you entered the park? No, we were going in the directions. Okay. And when you first saw her, where were you? Were you in the grass or were you on the trail? On the trail. All right. And were you moving or you, were you standing still? Like I was moving listening to music. You were, you were walking or jogging? Walking. Walking? And you were walking towards her? I was walking towards her and then like side to side and then okay. one thing led to another. When you first saw her though, were you walking towards her or the same direction as her? When you first saw her? We walked towards each other. Towards each other, okay. And she was jogging, you said? Mm-hmm. All right. Do you know if she had... Uh, Anything on was anything on her head or in her hands? You remember as she was approaching you? She might have had a phone. Okay. And where would her where was her phone? Was it in her hand or was it clipped to her clothes? Do you remember? It was in her hand. Okay. And uh, you said as, as she got next to you, when she got next to you, as you as she was running and you were walking, what happened then? And then you know, because of a past situation, I got angry and then. By hitting her and stuff like that. Okay. Um, before you did, where did you hit her? Like in the face and like in the mouth. In the face and the mouth. Mm -hmm. Before you hit her, did you grab her or did you just hit her right away? Well, I kind of grabbed her first. Grabbed her? Then, like, how did you grab her? What part of her body did you did you grab? I started hitting her because of the incident that was going on earlier. Right. Uh, but. Did you did you grab her before you started hitting her, or was the first thing you did was to hit her? What was the first thing you did? I grabbed her. Okay. And how did you grab her? Like this. Okay. With both hands? Mm-hmm. Okay. And what part of her body did you grab? Do you remember her shoulders, her waist, her neck? Do you remember? Probably like around here. Okay, around the shoulders. Mm -hmm. And when you grabbed her, what happened then? Then I started hitting her and stuff like that. All right. Now, um, did you hit her with both hands? Probably, yeah. All right. <coughs> and what part of her body did you hit with your hands? I didn't hit any part of her body. Her face? Just the face. Just the face? All right. About how many times did you hit her in the face? Around five. All right. Was she standing when you started to hit her, or was she on the ground? She was on the ground. Okay. So did she? when did she fall to the ground? After you grabbed her? All right. Now, when she fell to the ground, was she lying in the path, or was she off the path? The pathway. When, when, she, when she fell to the ground and you were hitting her, was she on the pathway, or was she off the pathway? She's kind of on the pathway. All right. About how wide is this path, would you say? like? A couple of feet. Okay, so it's not that wide, right? Mm -hmm. And um, when you were hitting her in the face, was she 
face up or face down? She was like face up. Face up. Did she say anything at all? Mm. No. Did she scream? <coughs> no, because her tooth broke. I'm sorry? Her tooth broke? Right. Were you covering her mouth at all? Mm. No? Okay. Um, the tooth that broke, was it like in the front, the top or the bottom, do you remember? <coughs> no. Okay. <coughs> how long would you say you were hitting her for? About how, how long in time? I mean? The whole thing was like about five minutes. Five minutes, all right. And did you do anything else to her besides hit her? Did you put her hands on any other part of her body? No. Okay, well, up around her neck or anything? Yeah, there was kind of separation. I'm sorry? Yeah. You put her hands on her neck? Around her neck? Okay. <coughs> do you remember, was it one hand or both hands? Both. Both? All right. And how long did you have your hands around her neck? No. Okay. Did you squeeze her neck when you had your hands around her neck? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. You don't remember for how long, though? Okay. Because I was mad at an incident. You were mad about an incident. Okay, we're, we're going to get to that in a little bit, all right? I just want to find out what happened, all right? Um, and... Was she still moving when you had your hands around her neck? Oh well, yeah, and then she jumped into the water. Okay. Well, when you had your hands around the neck, was she on the ground or standing up? She still on the ground. On the ground. Face up or face down? Face up. All right. And then, how did her face go in the water? Oh, uh, strangling. We were near the water, and then uh, put her face in the ground. Okay. You were strangling so she her. You said. Water. And, and you she, put her no, she fell in the water. Okay. And then my hand was bleeding, so I went to wash off all the blood. Okay. Which hand do you remember? Uh, you just showed me your right hand, right? Your mm -hmm. right hand. Where was it bleeding? What part of the hand? Your knuckle. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when her face went in the water, was she face up or face down? Down. Down. Or face up. A face up. Yes. All right. Was the water covering her face? Mm -hmm. And how long did you hold her under the water? Oh, she didn't hold her under the water. When I came back, she was just... Oh, you didn't hold her under the water? Okay. Was she uh, was she moving when you put her face in the water? She, went over, she was not moving. Okay. What Do you remember, was she still moving <coughs> when you had your hands around her neck? At all? Mm -hmm. How was she moving? What was she doing? Like she wasn't really moving that much. Okay. Did she um, try to hit you or <coughs> do it, touch your body a little during this time? Okay, what, what, what did she do? I tried to scratch me. Okay, and um, did she scratch you? Where did she scratch you? Uh, my face. Okay, would that be on the, the, um, the right side of your face? Probably was one of these two though. Okay, did she leave a mark or a scratch on your face? Yes. Mm hmm All right. Um, so at, at some point, before she went into the water, she had stopped moving, is that right? Mm -hmm. She stopped moving before her face went into the water, correct? All right. Did, um... Kinda. I'm sorry. I kinda did. Kinda did? All right. What, could you tell if she was breathing or not? What you say? Uh, repeat the last question. Could you tell if she was breathing? No, the other one. Oh, before that? I yeah. said, oh, at some point before she went out, <coughs> she stopped moving, and you said kind of, right? This, this is like after the, after the water. Well, that when when you when she went when you put her in the yeah. water was she still moving oh, then? In the water, she fell in the she water. She fell. Was she moving then? After that, she wasn't moving. Okay. Did yeah. she fall in the water when you first threw her to the ground, or when you're on the ground with her head in her? Did she like kind of move towards the water? It was more like a strangulation, and then she went into the water. So it was after you had your hands on her neck that she went in the water. Mm -hmm. All right. Um. And. What did you do then, after that? After that, she was just lying there, and then I got her by her ankles, and then picked her up by from from her back and put her in the bushes. Okay. Like, can you just describe to me like how you moved her? Like, what part of of the body were you holding when when you moved her? Like the, on the hands. And okay. On up her back. Did you have were your hands holding her arms, or were your hands under her arms, or like holding it? Your hands were holding one hand on each one of her hands? Like how you just grab and just put somebody, yeah. You saw you were dragging her by the by the hands or the arms, right? Yeah. 
And when you dragged her, was was she facing down onto the ground or facing up to the sky? Up to the sky. Facing up. Okay. And where did you drag her to? Mm, somewhere off the pathway. Off the pathway. Mm -hmm. What's on the side of the pathway? Bushes, trees, grass. Like some really rough kind of trees. I mean, some really rough um. It's called weed and leaves. Weed and leaves. Okay. About how high would you say it was? Was it high or like? Eight, eight feet or something like that. Like higher than your head when you're standing? Yeah. Right. How far off the path did you, would, you th would you say you dragged her into the grass? Like how, how many feet about? About, probably about ten. Okay. Um, after you dragged her in the grass, did you go back onto the path? Mm-hmm. Okay. When you got back onto the path, could you see her from where you were, from the path? Mm-hmm. Okay. I think you said, um, Chanel, that she had a phone with her, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know what happened to her phone? She must have lost it when all that. Did you ever grab her phone? Mm. Yeah? I might have touched it. Okay. If you touched it, do you know where? <laughs> did you put it somewhere? Or? No. No? Okay, when, do you remember when you touched it? No, I was still in the school phone. Okay. All right. Did you touch anything else that she might have had with her? I wouldn't have known. Um, <clears throat> when you left her in the grass, what were, were her clothes still on? Was no. She, what was the um, st status of her clothing? How was, how was her clothing was arranged? Like pulled off. Pulled off? Yeah. Okay, what was pulled off? Like her clothes. Her shirt, her pants? Her pants. What about her shirt? I think it was still left intact. Still, May, maybe. Okay. And when you say her pants were pulled off, were they totally off, or were they half on, or half off? What were they? Look like kind of half off. Okay. Um, were they down or up? I mean, her pants. Kind of like down. Okay. What about her underwear? Maybe it was down too. Okay. Did you um, touch her in any way in her her? Uh, her um, her vagina, her anus at all? Mm-mm. Not at all? Mm-mm. Okay. Now, you said that you did this because you had some anger. Is that right? Mm hmm All right. Um, can you tell me about that anger? Because, you know, I used to live in a different address than I currently live right now. Right. And then there's sometimes there's this man that comes around there he play like a lot of music and carry a lot of friends around there. I didn't like it because I feel unsafe and comfortable. And I like my place private right. and peaceful. And usually I just... Okay. Sometimes. What place was this that you used to live in? A different place? What place was it? It was the same neighborhood but a different street. It was at Logan Street. The neighborhood where you live now? Yeah. Okay. And where do you live now? Where I live now is Essex Street. What's the address? 576 Essex Street. Okay. And is that a big house, little house? Or? It's kind of like uh, it's kind of like a three-story. Okay. What floor do you live on? We live in the basement. Okay. Who's who's we? Who do you live with? My mom, my sisters. How many sisters? Two. Two. Okay. What are their names? Flip and Suita. Okay. About are they older than you or younger than you? Older. Older. Okay. How long? And the place you said you lived before that, you said it was Logan Street. Mm -hmm. That's that's near Essex Street, right? Mm -hmm. All right. And there was someone there who ang who got you angry. Do you remember who that was? Mm -hmm. Do you remember who that was? Well, no, I wouldn't really want to say his name. Okay. Is your brother? Do you have any brothers? Ah, uh, yeah, brother. But <coughs> he don't live with us no more. <coughs> Is he older or younger than you? Older. Where does he live now? He lives somewhere in East Flatbush. How old is he? About 27, 20, around that area. What's his name? Shaman. Shaman? Do you see him a lot? Yeah, he comes around the house every once in a while. Does he know this person that you have a, an issue with? Yeah. Did that particular person 
You don't have to tell us who he is, but did he did he make you angry that day on August second, that Tuesday? Yeah, because like every every day he keep playing music, and inviting his friends, and no, we just live in a quiet block. Mm -hmm. We don't like all of these type of stuff. Okay, and about what time was that? Hmm? What time was that that he was playing the music and got you annoyed and got it's you angry? Pretty much, pretty much all day. All right. Well, and what time? <clears throat> when did you leave your house to go to that park that day? Probably left about. 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. In the afternoon, early afternoon? Yeah. And how far is your house to that? It's called Spring Creek Park, right? Is that mm -hmm. what it's called? Yeah. How far is your house from that park? It's probably like a couple of blocks. All right. And how did you get to the park? Usually I just go to the industrial place and then go to um, the mall and then go, go across the bridge. Okay. Did you walk? Did you ride a bike? or Walk. Okay. Was anybody with you? Mm -hmm. did, did, did you tell anybody that you were going to the park before you went? Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, you entered the park through, what, what, how, what entrance way did you get into the park? What street Bell is that? Bell Parkway. By the Bell Parkway entrance? All right. And how far into the park did you walk when you, how did you walk when you first saw um, the girl? I walked to one trail and then went to the next trail. Okay. So how far would you say in distance you had walked when you ran into her? What do you mean? Well, at some point while you were inside the park, you were listening to music, right? Mm -hmm. And were you listening to music through headphones or, or the radio or how we listened to music? Right. Oh, so your phone? phone yeah. All right. And at some point while you're walking, listening to music, you see the girl jogging towards you, right? So, how far had you been? How far had you walked, like from the from the point you entered until you saw her coming? Along, halfway through, more than halfway through, or it's kind of like one trail and then you go to the next trail. Okay, so you took one trail to the next trail. All right, and um, from the time you first grabbed the girl until the time you dragged her into the grass and left her there, about how how long you think that took? You know, when you punched her and strangled her, how long would you say it lasted? About five minutes. Okay. Now, had you ever gone to that park like before this date? Would you go there on, on occasion? Or? Yeah, sometimes when I was when I get angry and stuff like that. How many times would you say you've been there before to the park? Like several times. More than three, four times. Yeah. Okay. Would you always go into the park by that trail? All right. And would you always walk, or there would other ways to get there? I always walk. So you, would you walk the same route? Mm, sometimes I do. Sometimes I choose a different route. Okay. Did um Did you ever go there with someone else, with friends or anything? No. No. Okay. Did you ever want on while you were in that area? Did you ever once get spoken to by police in the area like before this happened? I mean, I got stopped once by the police. Yeah. How long before this was that? Probably a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. A couple of months before the August 2nd? Yeah. Okay. No, I know, um, uh, Chanel, I know that, uh, like last night, you, you, did, you really didn't want to talk about this, right? Last night. But today it was okay, you wanted to talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. I know that you told um, Detective Brown you wanted to straighten your life out, right? Yes. Okay. And then Detective Brown said to wait until you came in the room to talk about it. That's right? Mm -hmm. And that's what you did, right? Yes. Okay. I know that um, I think Detective Brown showed you this map before when uh, he spoke to you, right? Remember mm -hmm. this map? Okay. Can you show me on the map, like, where, what point, like, what, that you ent actually entered into the park? Just put a little dot there. Okay. Thanks. And is that the same way you went out? Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you went out, were you walking or running? Do you remember? Walking. Walking, okay. And where did you go after you left the park? Pretty much my hand was really hurting me, so I went home. Okay. Was it like bleeding heavily, or was it just like a scratch, or a, do you remember? Like, it was sweating a little bit, so. Sweating and bleeding? And pain a little bit, so, yeah. Hurting? Right. And um, you said you had some scratches on your face, right? All right. Um, where did you go after you left the park? Did you go out somewhere? Did you go home? 
Went home. Okay. Was anyone home when you got there? Mm -hmm. okay. I got my own keys, so I just went. Did anyone see you that evening? Mm, yeah, some people, they were asleep. Hmm? They were kind of, yeah, they see me. Okay, did they ask you what happened to your face? Did they notice they had a scratch on your face, anybody? Not really, but they, know, they noticed this, like... What did you say about yeah. that? I said I fell. Okay. Did you say where? Mm-hmm. What did you say? I said Gateway Mall Park. Okay. Can you just tell us what this girl looked like? Was she a black girl, Chinese girl, Spanish girl, white girl? Do you remember? She looked white. Okay. About how big was she? About five, about five, four, five, three, I guess. Heavy, slim, medium? Kind of medium. Okay. Had you ever seen her before? No. Did you ever go back to that same park, Spring Creek Park, after August 2nd, after this date? Mm -mm. Never? Okay. Chanel, after uh, her face is in the water and you pick her up and you drag her into the weeds, does she move at all at that point or make any more noises? Mm -mm. No? At what point did she stop moving and making any sounds? when she was under the water. Under the water? Mm -hmm. Like as she was under the water or bef right before you put her in? Mm -hmm. As she was under the water. Were you holding her under the water? At that point, no. I was too busy cleaning off the blood from my hand. Okay. Was she still moving while you were strangling her around the neck? She was moving like, quite a little bit, yeah. Is that when she scratched your face? No, it was when I was hitting. When you were hitting her, she scratched your face? Mm -hmm. When you were hitting her, were you standing over her, or were you like sitting on her chest, or how, how did where how were you positioned when you were hitting her? Like I was on top. But were you standing on top, or were you like were your knees on the ground? Were you like, you know, were you low, or were you standing up on your feet? Like it was kind of like between, like in the middle, between the middle of standing and crouching. Well. Crouching like like a catcher in baseball, or with your knees on the ground? It's more like a. One with the baseball. Like a catcher with baseball? Yes, Did you ever hit it with anything or did you hit it with your hands? Just the hands. Okay. Oh, and all the all the punches were to her face, right? Mm-hmm. And you said it was with both your hands? Mm-hmm. You only got the injury to the one hand? Would you say use that hand more? Yeah, it's more like it on that hand, yeah. Are you a righty? Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you notice whether her she suffered any injuries as a result of the punches? Just a broken tooth. Yes. That's it? Was do you remember could you see if she was bleeding or not? Or black? No. Not really Smaller? Checked. You didn't check? Okay. Was she did she say anything to you? Was she able to other than maybe if she screamed, did she was she able to communicate at all? Say any words, any sentences? Mm -hmm. Did you say anything to her while it's happening? Mm -hmm. And this, you were angry because of what happened in your neighborhood. Yes. Were you angry about what happened in Howard Beach? Did you have any friends or people you knew who lived in the neighborhood by Howard Beach? No. No? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, um, the time is... Talking about I'm sorry. I was talking about... Uh, what you was talking about um, with him? Rest of what? What? I was 
Is that called again? Did I spell what? You said it. I said, did you have any friends in the area? You said, no, I whispered to me. Wait, it was something you said. Subsequently, Lewis was charged with homicide and intimate violations, amongst other offences. This marked the pivotal turning point in the case. The trial of Chanel Lewis revolved around the presentation of compelling evidence, particularly his DNA found under Karina Vetrano's fingernails. During his interrogation, which was played for the jurors, Lewis admitted to authorities that he had encountered Vetrano whilst he was in a bad mood, a bad mood that was provoked by a neighbour's loud music. He went on to confess that he became angry and attacked Karina. He said he hit her in the face and mouth. Mouth. However, Lewis's defence lawyers contended that his confession had been coerced. They also raised concerns about the potential tainting of the crime scene by the victim's father. When he discovered Karina's body, he lifted her up and hugged her. The trial was marked by intense deliberations, and on November 20th, 2018, after 14 hours, the jury reported their verdict. They were deadlocked. As a result, the judge declared a mistrial. This left the case in a state of uncertainty. The prosecutors promptly announced their intent to retry the case. They said that this legal battle was unresolved. Between that day and the start of Chanel Lewis's retrial, police worked to gather as much evidence as they could to ensure a new outcome. According to Lewis's mother, he looked dishevelled and injured when he arrived home on the night of August the 2nd. She added to say that his clothes were torn. Lewis had explained to her that he was mugged on the way home. The next morning, Lewis's father took him to the emergency room, looking for treatment for the scratches and cuts on his upper body. This was as well as a boxer's injury to his fist. A boxer's injury is normally a broken metacarpal on the little finger due to the impact of a punch. Evidence gathered from the doctor that treated Chanel revealed that his hand injury was likely the result of punching someone. Crucially, evidence also showed that Lewis's cell phone placed him in the park at the time of the homicide. His device also contained downloaded images of the crime scene and internet searches about second chances. At the start of the second trial in March of 2019, this new evidence was presented along with the existing evidence from the previous trial. However, in response, the defence had their own thoughts on this evidence. The defence lawyer argued for reasonable doubt. They emphasised the absence of fingerprints or hair and pointed out the need for more precise DNA evidence. In all actuality, it was possible that Chanel's DNA on Karina could have been a result of secondary transference. This meant that Chanel's DNA could have been transferred onto Karina through the fact that both of them touched the same object. The defence contended that the investigation by the police was sloppy. They said that they failed to thoroughly check for evidence. Additionally, they continued to assert that Chanel was coerced into his confession. They noted that many of his statements were inconsistent with the actual evidence. He stated that the cause of Karina's passing was the fact that she had drowned, face down in a puddle, when the evidence showed that she was actively strangled. Chanel also seemed confused and unclear at times. This raised suspicions on the part of the defence as to whether his confession was genuine. They raised concerns about tunnel vision clouding their judgement, latching onto Chanel as the culprit out of desperation to finally close the case. On March 28, 2019, as both the defence and prosecutors rested their cases, a surprising turn of events unfolded. An anonymous letter was sent to the defence team. This alleged that prosecutors had withheld potentially exculpatory material. Exculpatory material refers to evidence or information that is favourable for the defendant in a criminal case. Evidence that shows their innocence or casts doubt on their guilt. This evidence can include facts, documents, witness statements, or any information that would help exonerate the accused. It is the legal and ethical duty of the prosecutors to provide this material to the defence. This is part of their obligation to ensure a fair trial. 
failure to disclose this information can be a violation of a defendant's rights, and therefore this may lead to the overturning of a conviction. The defence lawyers Julia Burke and Robert Moeller found a plain envelope with no return address in their office. The three-page typed letter pointed attorneys to several meetings among investigators, meetings during the initial two weeks of the investigation. According to the unknown author, NYPD Deputy Chief Michael Kemper had stated on multiple occasions at these meetings that they were looking for two jacked-up white guys who are from Howard Beach, while Chanel Lewis was slight and and African American. Additionally, the letters revealed that after Chanel Lewis's DNA was taken, one of the detectives reported back to Lieutenant John Russo saying, He's not the perp. He's too puny and dim witted. In response to this case altering information, the defence planned to submit motions seeking a hearing to address the prosecution's alleged failure to disclose this, as well as even more damning exculpatory evidence. They also look to challenge the New York Police Department's unconstitutional racial profiling throughout the investigation. On April 1st, 2019, Queen's Supreme Court Justice Michael Aloise delivered significant rulings in the case. He denied all of the defense's motions to conduct a hearing about the allegations in this anonymous letter. Additionally, he dismissed the defense's request for a mistrial. Following these rulings, the closing arguments commenced. The jurors began deliberating at around 4pm, and remarkably they reached their verdict by 9pm. Chanel Lewis was, this time, found guilty of first-degree homicide, of two counts of second-degree homicide, and of first-degree intimate violations. His sentencing was scheduled for April 17th, and under New York State's criminal law for first-degree homicide, Lewis faced a maximum penalty of life without the possibility of parole. However, on the same day, Chanel Lewis's attorneys filed a motion requesting an evidentiary hearing regarding allegations of juror misconduct. This motion led to the postponement of the sentencing and the hearings related to these allegations were scheduled for April 22nd. The judge ultimately dismissed these claims and continued with the sentencing. When the day arrived, Justice Michael B. Aloise delivered a powerful sentence to Chanel Lewis. He told him that if he ever intended to atone for his crime, he would have to do so inside a prison cell. The courtroom was filled with tension as Lewis awaited his sentencing. Before the sentencing, Chanel heard heart-wrenching statements from Karina's father, from her mother and her two siblings. They remembered Karina as a bright light in their lives, and they emphasised the terror that she must have experienced in her final moments. The Vetrano family pleaded with Justice Aloise to impose the maximum sentence. They were also strongly critical of Lewis's defence team. When Chanel Lewis had the opportunity to speak, he declared his innocence and offered condolences to the Vetrano family. He continued to maintain that he did not commit the crime. Karina's older sister, Tana, directed harsh words towards Lewis. She described him as unremarkable and insignificant, wishing for him to live a life of darkness and fear. Philip, Karina's father, shared the profound impact of his daughter's loss to their family. He conveyed that they were living as though their lives had ended, with their faith in God and their belief in heaven being the only things preventing them from succumbing to their despair. Karina's mother disputed the defence's portrayal of Lewis as an emotionally challenged young man. She described him as a clever and remorseless criminal with an empty soul. Justice Aloise, echoing the religious sentiments expressed by the Vetrano family, believed that Karina now sat beside God. He urged Lewis to embrace the concept of redemption and second chances. This was a reference to the research found on his cell phone. Ultimately, Justice Aloise rejected the defence's plea for a lighter sentence, a plea based on Lewis's mental and emotional difficulties. 
Chanel Lewis, in his sentencing, met the consequences of his actions. He would serve life in prison with no chance of parole. According to Karina's writings, it's chaotic and unpredictable, but I do believe that on some days it's quite beautiful in all its poetic little tragedies. She was just she starting. She is. She is. She's just starting her adult life. Naomi Irion had a unique upbringing, growing up in shelter communities in Russia, Germany, and South Africa. This was primarily due to her father's State Department job, which required the family to move frequently. However, in 2001, Naomi's life took a new turn. She moved to the United States with her brother, Casey. The prospect of living in a country somewhat known for its freedom and its opportunities must have been an exhilarating prospect for Naomi. One of the things Naomi eagerly looked forward to was learning how to drive. In the countries she had previously lived in, transportation was often limited to public options. Therefore, she had always dreamt of having the independence to drive her own car. She couldn't wait to pass her driving test and hit the open roads, exploring her new home's vast landscapes and cities. The USA is the home of the road trip. Another aspect of life in the United States that excited Naomi was the opportunity to get a job. Naomi was eager to take on a job and become financially independent. As well as this, dating was another aspect of American life that intrigued Naomi. In the sheltered communities that she grew up in, dating was not as common or as openly discussed. However, in the United States, she saw the opportunity to meet new people, to form new connections, and to experience the joy and excitement of romantic relationships. Lastly, Naomi was thrilled to have the opportunity to attend community college. In her previous countries of residence, the educational options were somewhat limited, and attending college to her was often a distant dream. However, in the US, she saw the chance to pursue her academic interests, to expand her knowledge and work towards her career goals. After moving to the States, she chose to settle in Fernley, Nevada. This is located around a six-hour drive from Las Vegas. Fernley is renowned for being a safe area, a fact that brought great relief to Naomi's family, knowing that she will be living in a secure place. Shortly after her relocation, Naomi received an offer to work at a Panasonic factory in Reno. This opportunity filled her with excitement. She could finally realise her much-anticipated dreams to build a new life in her adopted country. Every day to get to her job at a Panasonic factory, Naomi would drive her car to the nearby Walmart parking lot and then take a shuttle bus to work. Naomi's new job at the Panasonic factory took an unfortunate turn, however. She sadly encountered harassment at work. Realising the importance of addressing this issue, Naomi decided to bring the matter up to her superiors. By doing so, she made a courageous step towards resolution and, in a small way, justice. Upon receiving Naomi's report, her superiors addressed the complaint internally. But despite this harassment at work, Naomi still tried to live out her American dream. On Saturday, March the 12th, she drove her car to Walmart to wait for the shuttle bus to take her to work. However, Naomi never showed up for work on that day, something which was very much unlike her. When she didn't return home later that night, her family knew something was very, very wrong. The family made numerous attempts to reach out to her, trying to establish contact through text messages and through phone calls. However, all of their efforts went unanswered. Concerned about Naomi's well-being, her family decided to involve the police. The authorities initiated their investigation by visiting the Walmart parking lot. This was the last known location where Naomi had been seen. They were determined to gather any evidence that could shed a light on her whereabouts. And in their pursuit of Naomi, the police obtained security camera footage from the Walmart premises all in the hopes it could provide a crucial lead or an explanation. Police carefully examined the footage captured in the Walmart parking lot, and what they witnessed left them deeply disturbed. 
the video depicted a man emerging from a nearby homeless encampment. He was skulking around various vehicles. Eventually, he approached Naomi's car. He forcefully coerced her into the passenger seat before taking the driver's seat for himself. This distressing scene left no doubt in the minds of her family. Their precious Naomi had been kidnapped. On the Tuesday following Naomi's disappearance, authorities made a significant discovery. Her vehicle was found abandoned in an industrial area in Fernley. Crime scene investigators swiftly arrived and commenced a thorough search of her car. However, they kept the details of their findings away from the media's prying eyes. Whilst they remained tight-lipped about the specifics, authorities did disclose that they uncovered evidence within Naomi's car. Evidence that raised suspicions about her sudden disappearance. As the search continued, the Urian family turned to social media in a desperate attempt to find her. Sister Tamara took to TikTok to address her sister's sudden disappearance and abduction. In a heartfelt video, Tamara pleaded with viewers to share the video and to help spread awareness about Naomi's situation. She was just she starting is. She is. She's just starting her adult life. The family's hopes pretty much rested on the power of social media. Social media has a unique way of reaching as many people as possible, and hopefully this could lead to any information about Naomi's whereabouts. Naomi's brother also had a message for the person responsible for kidnapping their sister. With a stern tone, he declared, We're on to you. According to Casey, Naomi's older brother whom she lived with, she went on a date in Reno the night before her disappearance. During the date, they visited thrift stores together. Casey mentioned that Naomi appeared in good spirits when she returned home. He stated, I'm not sure if they had been out before. I saw her afterwards. I have no reason to believe that this person was involved. Naomi's parents, Hervey and Diana, who were living in South Africa, decided to fly to Nevada to assist with the search for their missing daughter. Diana was understandably devastated when she received the news that her daughter had disappeared. The emotional pain she experienced was overwhelming. She said it was as if her heart had exploded with anguish. It felt like the world was crashing down around them at that moment, and she feared she may not survive the ordeal. The severity of Diana's emotional distress was evident to those around her. This prompted the embassy to take action. Recognising the gravity of the situation, they sent a doctor to accompany her during her journey to the United States from South Africa. This decision was made because Diana was in such a state of shock that she required immediate medical attention and support. No piece of information is too small to report. At this point, we need every everyone's help across the nation because the incident happened so close to I-80. She could be anywhere. According to a report by Business Insider, Casey, Naomi's brother, stated that her disappearance was particularly devastating for the family. He said that Naomi was considered their miracle baby. It was revealed that Naomi was conceived shortly after Diana, her mother, had experienced a tragic lost pregnancy. During the final stages of Diana's pregnancy with Naomi, Doctors informed her that there was a high probability of Naomi's life being at risk. This was said to be due to a lack of amniotic fluids. However, Naomi, against all odds, survived. Casey said that it was a miracle that saved her life as a baby, and it was a miracle they needed to save her now. The police informed the public that the person that they believed had abducted Naomi was seen driving a dark, newer model Chevrolet Silverado high country truck. This information was shared in an effort to gather any leads or information that may assist in locating Naomi. Law enforcement agencies actively conducted searches on the ground and by air to find her. People came out to look for her on ATVs and on horseback. In a significant development, the FBI made an announcement regarding the case. They declared that they would be offering a reward of up to $10,000 to anyone who provided information leading to Naomi's whereabouts. On March the 25th, the police officers investigating Naomi's disappearance 
announced that they had now made an arrest. The suspect taken into custody was identified as 41-year-old Troy Driver. In addition to apprehending the suspect, the officers also impounded his truck in order to search for any potential evidence related to this case. Despite having a suspect in custody, the whereabouts of Naomi remained unknown, so the investigation continued in the hope of bringing her back safely. Casey, Naomi's brother, told the media, What's going through my mind right now is that there's a potential suspect, and it seems like it might be one more step towards finding Naomi. I'm very optimistic. Searches continued even after Troy Driver was arrested for kidnapping. However, despite the intensified efforts, no sign of the missing teenager could be found. As the days passed, her family's worry grew increasingly more profound. Nobody had still heard any word from Naomi. They believed if she could, she would have been in touch. Despite Troy Driver's arrest, the investigation did not come to a halt. Law enforcement agencies, volunteers and citizens tirelessly combed through every possible lead and followed any potential clue, hoping for that one breakthrough that would shed light onto Naomi's whereabouts. However, the relentless search yielded no results. On March 29th, a tip regarding Naomi led the police to a remote part of the neighbouring town of Churchill County. Tragically, at the scene, they discovered a gravesite and recovered a woman's body. Subsequent DNA tests confirmed that the body belonged to Naomi. As a result, her death was automatically classified as a homicide. Mother Diana expressed that learning about her daughter's demise was the most devastating experience she had ever faced. The unimaginable pain and sorrow that engulfed her upon receiving this tragic news was beyond anything she had ever encountered. As a mother, Diana had always cherished and protected her daughter, hoping to shield her from harm. However, this harsh reality shattered her dreams and left her heartbroken. Sister Tamara shared her anguish and struggles since her sister went missing. She admitted that deep down, she had been preparing herself for the possibility that Naomi may never return home. The constant fear and uncertainty consumed her thoughts, making it impossible for her to find any solace. Tamara confessed that she had shed endless tears, unable to escape the horrifying images that haunted her mind. She was stuck envisioning the worst possible fate for her beloved sister. After Naomi's body was discovered, the police decided to bring additional charges against Troy Driver, the man that was already suspected of kidnapping Naomi. These new charges included murder with the use of a deadly weapon, robbery, burglary, destruction of property and assault. Due to the severity of these charges, Troy Driver was deemed a significant threat to society. He was subsequently held in custody at the Lyon County Jail. Driver pleaded not guilty in court. However, as he was awaiting trial for Naomi's murder, he ended his own time on this earth whilst in custody in August of 2023. Prison officials revealed that Troy had made two previous attempts before finally succeeding on August the 6th. Before his initial attempt, Troy handed a confession letter to his ex-girlfriend. In this letter, he expressed that the guilt was crushing. His ex-girlfriend wasted no time in delivering the letter to law enforcement. During a press conference after Troy Driver's death, the police made a shocking revelation. They announced that Troy's DNA was discovered on Naomi's body, leaving no doubt in their minds about his guilt. According to officials, Troy had a troubling criminal history, a history that began at a very young age, and it involved acts of animal cruelty. Furthermore, it was revealed that Troy had a deep fascination with serial killers, he was known to immerse himself in true crime, constantly listening to podcasts and avidly reading books about notorious murderers. Naomi's family has explicitly expressed their desire for her murderer not to gain fame or notoriety. Instead, they hope people will remember Naomi for the legacy of love that she left behind in this tragic case. Naomi was a remarkable young woman known for her kind and loving nature. 
She was still at the beginning of her life, a life that began quite miraculously. She was full of aspirations and dreams just waiting to be fulfilled. The potential she possessed was seemingly limitless. Amidst the grief and heartache, it is essential to honour Naomi's memory by focusing on her loving spirit and remembering the impact she had on others. Her family wished for her legacy to be one of compassion and kindness and the importance of cherishing every moment of life. By taking the time to discuss those that we love and have lost, we can ensure that their spirits live on, inspiring others to embrace their same virtues. What are your thoughts on this case? What do you think can be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Please do let me know down in the comments. If you appreciate what I'm doing here, please do remember to hit that like button. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.